This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. Williams to inbound. Simpson with it for the lead. Sixty-five Sports is presented by IdealMRI.com. High-quality MRIs for four hundred ninety-seven dollars or less. IdealMRI.com. Your health is important. So is your budget. Nice pass, Adu to connect. Good action there from Rick Barnes on that bench. 365 Sports is also brought to you by Texas Farm Bureau Insurance, protecting Texans since 1952. Alexander, what a move. Mrs. Green! Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Search 365 Sports on YouTube. Brought to you by TFNB, your bank for life. Conway all over Burns. The pass to Taylor. 365 Sports is turbocharged by Unite Private Networks. Find out more at UnitePrivateNetworks.com. 1.2 seconds left. Texas A&M. Here's Taylor, keep in mind. As he race to that corner. Radford, the inbounder, looking to bounce. Garcia. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. All right, here we go. 365 Sports on a Tuesday afternoon. Craig Smoke and Paul Catalina to my right and left. I'm David Smoke, and we are glad you're with us today. We appreciate your time. Some men's basketball coaching news or nuggets. Also, an AD job that has been filled. Again, a reminder, on Thursday, we will be live throughout the day. We'll be recording some of the segments and interviews and being able to use that on Thursday during our show. We're live inside the Ford Center, the Star in Frisco, the Cowboys facility where the Big 12 will have their NFL Pro Days there uh, throughout the next few days. All right, uh, here we go. Pat Chun. This was not uh, any kind of surprise whatsoever. This makes a lot of sense. Pat Chun is headed to Washington. Ross Dellinger, among others, with the story, the Washington State AD will now be replacing Troy Dannon, who's now at Nebraska. In fact, he was introduced today in Lincoln. And a good response by Washington losing Dannon and finding Pat Chun. Yeah, that was huge. Uh, our buddy Softy, as soon as the Troy Dannon news hit, after his first like three tweets of, come on, you got to be kidding me, uh, what's going on here, what is my life uh, you know, that Softy goes through, were... Uh, UW needs to call Pat Chun right now. And it appears that they saw that and went, good idea, Softy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's what they did. It sucks for Washington State, but this is going to continue to happen to them with their uncertain future. Pat Chun's a rock star in the AD biz. He's he's grown up. And look, he's been through a war here with the Pac-12 and everything. So to move over and know what's gone on on kind of all ends of that front uh, and to move into to UW where, look, they, they just hired a new basketball coach, uh, which he either did <laughs> before we well, knew about this. Well, there's this news. Yeah. Danny Sprinkle Danny was Sprinkle. yesterday. He came in the afternoon, evening. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or um, they did, and now he doesn't have to do that because new football coach, new basketball coach, the two biggest hires you can make in an athletic department outside of the, the athletic director. So those are all done. So it's a completely new uh, set of faces there uh, in Seattle for the Huskies. Uh, but a great hire of Pat Chun. Yeah, I mean, this one makes a lot of sense. Uh, doesn't have to move too far from where he's already uh, been suited up. And, uh, yeah, now in Seattle and a part of the Big Ten, and the allure of that job is not hard to wrap your head around, uh, even if he was at a rival. So uh, makes a lot of sense from his standpoint and from Washington's as well. Um, I think for Washington State, you know, there was a brief celebration yesterday and probably one that's still carrying over in terms of the money that they've – been able to uh, acquire for themselves through their uh, lawsuit with the Pac-12 and the agreements that were made and the, uh, I guess, uh, eventual settlement that they agreement that they came to. Um, they've got you know a lot of money coming their way, and that's great. But you know, you read some post and you get the sense of it's uh, 
it's a situation where I think a lot of people who are obviously very hurt and rightfully so are trying to convince themselves that money is going to cure every problem that they have, that it's going to get them in a conference that it's going to do this and that's going to do that. And uh, clearly by the last 24 hours, it, it's not. They've lost their basketball coach. Now they've lost their AD. And a few weeks ago, they lost their football coach and uh, still don't quite know what the future holds for them. So it's still a really rough time for Washington State. They did have you know, that win yesterday, or at least the finalization of a win against the Pac-12, but... Um, the financial settlement, yeah. Yeah, the, the money part of it is, is great, but it's not the end-all, be-all, is, is what I'm saying, and that's evident by the moves that have been made here uh, this offseason so far. Your AD, your basketball coach, your football coach, all leaving. So, I mean, some of that was going to happen regardless of whether anything had ever changed with the Pac-12 or not. Now, that's just natural, but... Um, when all that occurs in the same time span and you still don't really have a great grasp on what the future looks like, uh, that money's going to come in handy, certainly, but it's not going to cure all of your problems right now. All right, so Washington takes from Washington State with Pat Chun to replace Troy Dannon, who today was introduced at Nebraska. And I mentioned Danny Sprinkle, Utah State, made a nice run with them. Now the head coach at Washington. Now Oklahoma State and their job is uh, – uh, open because of uh, Mike Boynton being fired at the end of the season. Uh, here's from Adam Zagoria that Nico Medved, Steve Alford, and how about Bryce Drew from Grand Canyon, Scott's brother, uh, also in the mix as far as the uh, uh, job to replace Mike Boynton. Scott Drew loves Jerome Tang, loves Grant McCaslin, loves all of his former coaches on his tree, but he hates to have to play against them because it's just an emotional thing, and I get it. Um, and can you imagine what it's going to be like if Bryce Drew, if in fact that occurs, becomes in his same conference with McCaslin, Tang, and then Bryce Drew? Oh. That's a possibility. I, Scott would just like, that might be a reason he looks at somewhere else to he go. He and Jerome Tang both shed tears yeah. when they had to play each other. Yeah. Tears. Yep. And because they're so cool, like Jerome Tang might as well be Jerome Tang Drew because they, I mean, they are family, family. And they're not actual family. Scott, and he's asked, been asked the question, like when Bryce was at Vanderbilt, now that he's at Grand Canyon, hey, are we going to see them on the schedule? And emphatically, only in the NCAA tournament, only NCAA tournament, basically saying the only way that I will play my brother in anything is if I have no choice. That's the only way I want to do it. So, it, and look, Bryce Drew, I think, would be a great hire for Oklahoma State. I just know that it would for both of them would be very like emotional when they do face off. Yeah, I mean, let's see if it happens first before worrying too yeah. much about it, but uh, it's certainly understandable why he's a candidate, and those other names make sense as well. Kind of surprised that Oklahoma State's still out there without a – uh, you know, a head person in charge yet, but uh, we eagerly wait to see who that will be now that West Virginia's knocked out uh, their opening. And, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of speculation right now just in terms of the transfer portal and all the different things going on. So you definitely don't want to wait too much longer to make a hire, I wouldn't think, uh, if you were Oklahoma State. But uh, that's an attractive job. Those are great candidates. And I'm, uh, you know, going to sit back and, and see what they do hopefully here pretty soon. But, yeah, Bryce Drew would be – uh, kick between the legs for for Scott, who would be happy for his brother, but is already surrounded by a few too many allies. So I'm sure it would make the Big 12 meetings fun. The league meetings would probably be a blast, and he'd have like half the conference would be like his buddies, basically. But um, at the same time, I can understand not wanting to go toe to toe twice a year with your brother and then your brothers from other mothers, uh, <laughs> which he's already having to do. All right, hey, let's go to the one if you have it. I just sent you Garrett from uh, Max Olson on Nebraska's new AD, Troy Dannon. Look at this quote from Dannon. Uh, introduced, he goes, uh, understatement of the day, if you think the last five years of college athletics have been wild, the next five years will put it to shame. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, it's... it's I can't imagine... I'm sure there's a lot of things that can happen, but I can't imagine anything will top what we've seen um, with... Oklahoma, Texas, SEC, the following year with USC, UCLA, and then a breakup of a Pac-12 conference that's been in existence for decades in what's happened there. Stanford and Cal in the ACC, SMU, I don't know if we could do that, but I guess you probably can because it's all about the money, so where's the money going to take college athletics the next five years? Yeah, I mean, there's also all the TV deals and stuff, that yeah. took place, uh, NIL, uh, that 
being established and all that. So, yeah, I don't know if that it can really be maybe as uh, volume packed uh, stories wise as the last you know few years have been. But I can see where it's as crazy. I mean, you're about to start paying players like employees. So there's a big difference that's never happened before in college athletics. And you're also looking at uh, some sort of finality having to come to the ACC. Uh, Mm -hmm. And they have two teams who have made it pretty well known they don't want to be in the league anymore. And something's going to have to give there a settlement or uh, some other route going through the actual legal system, which I don't know that anybody really wants to put in all the the time and the effort and the finances that you would have to do to to see that from start to finish. So um, that's a big hanging piece right now is is Florida State, Clemson, and then the after effects of that. But between, um, I mean, the possibility is like, you know, if the SEC and the Big Ten were to go off and do their own thing, I think that would be pretty monumental. I, I, you know, I don't know how good for the game that would be overall, but that would certainly be a, a, a big landscape shift as well what's interesting though is nebraska seems to just their ad seemed to have the insight because i remember trev alberts used to always be the one that was talking about realignment like he was the only guy i saw that was consistently talking about it and dropping these little clues all over the place about what was still to come and everything so maybe that just comes with that role in lincoln i don't know but it's the college that runs america i guess so um but yeah he's he's first day on the job getting introduced and he's already talking about realignment so there's something yeah. there in, in lincoln but I mean, I, I can believe it to some extent. I don't know if it can be like as as wide ranging as all the things that we just mentioned the last few years, but it could be pretty significant. I mean, when you talk about just the things that I mentioned and, and maybe things that I'm even leaving out uh, that we haven't even thought about yet. I, the expanded I, playoffs are part of that right, the next right. few years, and, and that doesn't even seem like it's got a cap on it just yet because – we haven't even seen 12, and we're already shooting towards 14. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't put it past college sports to outdo itself. But, man, they've got a, a, a big big old uh, uh, challenge based on what we've seen the last several seasons. I'll stop for a second, and this was not a part of our rundown, but it, we, we, we need to look at this, and there's some other stories also to get to. But COVID, transfer portal, NIL, UTOU, USC, UCLA, the Pac-12 uh, falls apart Expansion of the playoff, Dartmouth and unionization of student athletes. Big Twelve adds uh, BYU. The, the Big Houston. Twelve adds what are now eight schools to what it was. Um, it, it's SMU's it, what it was in the ten. Power five. SMU's in the ACC. Cal Stanford on the East Coast, and so if it tops that since the summer of twenty, uh, the spring of twenty twenty with COVID. I always wondered about how everything kind of merged together at once and how much of a mess it would be because it seemed like it all happened and a lot of it was without any rules. Uh, and so here we are. Okay. Well, By the way, here's the thing is recruiting right now. I mean, to, to his point, recruiting's as wild as it's ever going to be right now. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. no rules. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's like no rules as far as enticements or NIL or any of that. There's nothing. It's as, it's as free and wide open as it's ever been right now and moving forward. So, I could definitely see that. Um, you know, I, I know that there's already been, I think it was like I saw like Josh Pate or somebody. Somebody had a video about like, just wait till you, there's always a lot of these like, I heard, but I can't tell you, but just wait. Yeah. And, and it was one of those about like, I think uh, the transfer portal and how that's going to look this this spring, you know? So now that you take away what rules were actually in place, which weren't doing a whole lot of good to begin with, and you strip those away, I can see where recruiting is going to get more wild than ever, which is hard to imagine, but probably going to be the case because you've you've taken out uh, the roadblocks for a lot of people that otherwise would maybe deter them from just going full bore, all right, pay for play, and, and let's go. Uh, so I, I can see where that gets about as wild as it's maybe ever been here in the very near future. By the way, John Wilner saying that Washington hiring Pat Chun is such an obvious move that I'm kind of surprised it actually happened. <laughs> uh, and then there was a couple of like what took so long has been just a, a handful of days. And Bob Thompson should have hired Chun last time they had an opening. President Koss, uh, uh lobs one last bomb at WSU. Washington State President Schultz on their way out the door. Yeah, and I'd also mention, um, I, think, I think it was a uh, pay video that uh, was talking not even so much about the recruiting, but it's recruiting related, but about the portal itself of like there's already moves being predetermined for guys that are in spring ball right now. Mm-hmm. Like they're already planned out where they're going after spring ball's over with. And like, I know it makes for a lot of fun and just chaos and people love messiness, but like, my gosh, man, it's uh that if, if that turns out to be like this scenario that was proposed where 
you can't even like go through spring ball and even care about who's on the team because it really doesn't even matter. I just that's just Why don't another they one. Just of- cancel spring ball. I mean, that may you know I'm not. They can't. They won't. Uh, they can. But yeah, I, I get it. Like because what are you doing? You're going through the motions so your roster can yeah. be churned around in about two or three a month later. Well, I, I mean, if you're having a quarterback battle and that quarterback wins the competition, then you say, oh yeah, by the way, I'm leaving. I, I got an offer from Ohio State, and I'm out of here. I mean, that's feasible. That could happen. Yeah. And so we'll see how ugly it gets. You know, sometimes the warnings are uh, a lot worse than the actual storm itself, but. College football does know how to cook up a good storm. So this spring, uh, with just player movement, uh, I think is going to be uh, really, really a fun treat. And by fun, I mean it could be awful or it could be like entertaining as all hell. We'll see. All right, Louisville basketball, which uh, all of their uh, media and not all of it, but a lot of them really just swore that Scott Drew was going to be the next head coach. And really, you never heard much from Scott. He said something with us, and he said maybe a, a comment or two during some of the uh, at the end of the year media sessions, but he did not, and I don't think that was ever close. I think there might have been an agent involved that helped maybe get a few more things uh, for Drew at Baylor, including even a better uh, chunk of NIL, not from GXG, but perhaps an endowment type thing. We still haven't been able to confirm that yet. He's not going to Louisville. Uh, Paul, they won a national title with Rick Pitino, correct? Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, then he was escorted basically out of the program. Yeah. Uh, Richard Patino, his son, who's at New Mexico, has done a great job, is now, well, apparently the leading candidate and or a legitimate candidate to replace Kenny Payne, that from Jeff Goodman from the field of 68. So since Rick Patino sued them, they can't really hire him back. But if they want to get any kind of Patino magic, they can hire Richard, uh, who... You know, has has been. It was in Minnesota. Now he's in New Mexico. You know, got the Lobos to the tournament. Um, you know, this would not be as big of a shot as they swung with Scott Drew, and I'm pretty sure they probably swung also with Dusty May, and he went to Michigan. Uh, so Louisville finds himself, and I do think that they find themselves in this peti- uh, position of looking to the past to try and move forward because. They spent too much time thinking about Scott Drew when that was a waste of time because he was not leaving and the time was not right for him to leave. There, to even get a shot at him, they would have to ask about seven years ago. And so now they find themselves in the unenviable position of Dusty Mays at Michigan, Danny Sprinkles at Washington, uh, Kyle Smith at Stanford. Um, you know, uh, DeVries is now at, at, at West Virginia. So the guys are drying up that are were available to you a lot easier than to get Scott Drew out of a place he just won a national championship at three years ago and got a new stadium built. That has put them in this position. It would shock me if they hired Richard Pitino, but, you know, desperation makes you go back and think about, well, maybe we're not as mad about some of those things. I like that he used the word legit candidate or the phrasing legit candidate in there as opposed to like just, I don't know. I think that was like a subliminal Scott Drew thing like because so much of that wasn't legitimate. And so he's using legit, I think, in kind of a a fun, harmless way. But uh, yeah, that's awfully interesting because of the last name. Uh, Louisville has got to be experiencing a bit of a reality check at the moment as far as where their program ranks can in reality versus where they think it it ranks. And uh, I think that's become obvious. Not that great schools don't have trouble from time to time hiring a a coach, but you would have thought that this would have been an easy process that would have been done, um, you know, much sooner than being here and going, oh, well, Richard Patino's a legit candidate now. And and I don't think that's where anybody's brains probably went initially for for Louisville fandom. So, yeah, uh, I, I guess we'll see what happens. And if that ends up being the case, then... Um, you know, we'll see what the reaction to that is, but it's not the the big home run that a lot of Louisville fans expected that they would hit. All right, uh, I want to get into something. Paul uh, would not be able to comment on this, but might have an opinion. Garrett surely wouldn't. I'm not sure, Craig, if you watched any at all, even a glimpse of the West Virginia and Iowa women's basketball game. Listen, I understand the Caitlin Clark and the star power, uh, and, and it's almost like people are falling all over themselves to try to make sure that, she even gets more coverage when she's earned a lot of the coverage. But I watched a game last night, and I, I always, I'm not one of those that gets into officiating referees. I, I am not. I don't 
I have, there are people that work for our site that it may be a minute into the game and they're already barking about the calls or whatever. I just think that's a waste of energy and it surely doesn't do any good. But I watched a game last night where the star power, um, I'm not trying to take away from Iowa. They're really good. But West Virginia had them in trouble last night. They had them in deep trouble last night. And there were, oh, my Lord, it's, it's, I, I'm not sure if she's protected, if ESPN wants to make sure she keeps to advance. She's in the Sweet 16. But I, I didn't like what I saw. I didn't, I didn't like what I saw. Iowa fans might lose their mind over that. That's fine. I just thought that it was really kind of weird uh, on, on a lot of the calls, as if she's Magic Johnson. Or something like that. I just thought I saw a lot of some protection last night to make sure they continue to advance. And that's, I agree, that's unfair for me to say it, but I have to say it. All right, well, I'll, I'll look at it this way. I'm, I must, you know, so you know me, I'm the eternal optimist. Uh, I, I always think the world is good. <laughs> we, uh, got bullet, we have bulletproof glass because <laughs> you're in here. <laughs> no, uh, I, uh, I actually think that if you've got a star that's getting calls... That's really good for women's basketball because it's been really good for the for the NBA, not the WNBA, uh, but it's been really good for the NBA. So if you've got a, a a player that's so good that they're giving her calls, you know what? It might suck for the team that's playing her, but man, uh, I certainly loved watching Michael Jordan in the '90s not get called for some of the same stuff that other people did, and I have no problem saying that. You are. A lost soul. I definitely am. You but don't even watch no, the NBA anymore. I watch it in the playoffs. It's just uh, the season's too okay. long. But yeah, yeah, it's or it doesn't like. There's enough that doesn't matter I, in the season. I just that, I, I I know she's a tremendous scorer, all time scorer, all of that. I just thought, man, it was uh, it was interesting. And I've seen more than just part of the game last night. I've seen other moments too that I just wanted to say that. Um, yeah, I didn't watch, so I don't. I don't have some grand opinion on it. I was watching Monday Night Raw. If you want to get into the Rock and well, Cody I mean, Rhodes, that's that legitimate was. As hell. I think it was more exciting, actually. But um, <laughs> that's not made up. Uh, not for me. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, first of all, hats off to West Virginia and their squad for giving Iowa a run for their money. I know you don't want a consolation prize, and it doesn't make you feel any better about things. But I was like keeping tabs on that game and just kind of following along with what was. Uh, going on and, and the fact that uh, West Virginia was pushing them uh, to the brink um, you know I, I was I was about to flip over uh, at, at one point but got sidetracked and and so ended up seeing the final score and then obviously the the big amount of uh, I guess reaction to it and yeah there were a number of people who felt like West Virginia got absolutely screwed over by the officials I mean, when you look at the free throw disparity, it's understandable. Uh, you don't even have to watch the game. You just look at the free throw disparity, and you're going to have questions. You know, you might get those questions answered and go, oh, okay, well, that's why it happened. Uh, that West Virginia's out there just throwing elbows. All right, cool. They, they shot a lot of free throws. They do play, they do play a very physical style. There's that's no one doubt. part. Yeah. That, that was the Iowa defense that I saw most often, and that is something that even outsiders who are like, yeah, you know, West Virginia is a bit physical. And so there, there was an element of that that needs to be acknowledged, that it wasn't like these were all phantom calls and West Virginia is not a physical physical team and they weren't doing anything wrong. No, they absolutely were being very physical because I feel like that's how they could get to Iowa and get to Caitlin Clark. Um, and obviously it backfired. Um, but the disparity is where you go, okay, I don't care how physical you are. Like how in the world is it possible to shoot 30 free throws versus five? Well, I mean, and, and I know that there's been instances where that can like happen. A, and there wasn't a lot of ragtag fouls at the end of the game to stop the clock. You know what? Where a team might load up. Yeah. On like 10 you're or intentionally fouling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. And it wasn't that it was yeah. all calls. And, uh, for it to be 25 out of 30 to 3 out of 5 in terms of the free throws, I just, I mean, that's a 22-point swing in a game you lost by 10. Um, that's, that's hard to wrap your head around. Now, were a lot of those calls valid? It appears so. At least some of them were, based on me looking through neutral observers. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, the games, they're... Um, on the Hawkeyes home court, uh, because that's the way that the women's tournament operates. And I don't think this is a type of incident where you go like, well, oh, that's it. We got to go to neutral sites because I don't think that that would be good for the, the women's game overall. I don't think that that would, would be as solid as, as doing the first round games at home, but I don't know how, and, and this is we're as conspiracy laden as a mm -hmm. society as we've ever been. And I generally try to avoid I a lot too. of that because you fall down such a hole that it's just, it gets weird, man. But do I believe that the NCAA or whoever the powers that be 
could possibly want to see Caitlin Clark move on to the next sure. round? Absolutely, freaking lutely I do. Do I think that there could be like a, a huge disparity that allows that to happen? Absolutely, I do. Do I think the game was fixed? No. Right. But I do think a benefit of the doubt can be given and sway wildly to the point of you get 30 free throws versus five. Like, you know, and if West Virginia was fouling that much, Iowa just never fouled, basically. I mean, is that is that how it worked? Uh, they just never got into the bonus ever? They just, I, I, I don't know. 30 free throws to five free throws is just crazy. I keep wanting to look that up because I was looking at the box score. That's I, I crazy. saw the fouls, and I'm not mm. again. Again, sometimes fouls are la- some of those like at the end. There's five or six at the end to stop the clock, send them to the free throw line. It does seem to me. I agree. I don't think the I'm not. No, you you still got to make shots. You still got to make the free throws. Like Otani didn't have money on this game. I mean, uh, his uh, interpreter oh, didn't shit. have money on this game. But <laughs> you know, it, it does make you wonder of like, what the hell's going on? And do I think that? I mean, look, have we talked about these TV executives and these networks at, for the last two years. Do I think for a single second that there could be people that want to see Kalen Clark move on for the ratings? Absolutely, freaking I do. The whole network would love it. Absolutely, they'd love to see LSU, South Carolina, Iowa, and whoever else they just pick a team. They can't name a, a player on West Virginia squad. Um, and she's everywhere, Caitlin Clark. I mean, she's the star of the show, her and Angel Reese and various others. And so, yeah, I, I totally understand where you're coming from if you feel like West Virginia got screwed. Um, I, I totally get it just based on what we know about uh, the attention being paid to Caitlin Clark and based on uh, the disparity. Uh, now, do I think it's as clear-cut black and white as, as somebody maybe wants to make it and that this was all like so intentional and all that. No, I don't. But I, I just don't know how you deny the disparity, regardless of how physical one side's playing. By the way, we're going to talk UConn basketball with Dave Borges of the Connecticut Post here momentarily. In fact, we'll take that break. One other quick note. Andy Enfield, this is not official, but um, uh, Rodney Pete, who has been a part of USC, does a talk show. Uh, Aaron Torres uh, mentioning that Pete's saying that Andy Enfield – uh, has accepted the job at SMU. Have not seen anything else other than that. But that would replace Rob Lanier, who, by the way, immediately was hired by Rice. Lanier out at SMU, Andy Enfield at USC. And that job, of course, you think it's a great job, but they're about to be in the Big Ten. So I'm not sure exactly what that means as well. But there we are with that story. We'll watch to see if that happens before the end of the show today at 6. When, finish it up and we got to take a break. I mean, yes, that's interesting to leave USC for mm-hmm. SMU. I'm curious to hear more about the reasons as to why. Yep. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I don't have a lot of thoughts on it. Just that's that's interesting. You you don't typically bank on the USC basketball coach going to take the SMU job, but obviously SMU's profile has been a little bit lifted, and there are a lot of changes going on. Well, so when Bronny we'll see. James will be there next year. Yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean that's that's also interesting uh, that that he is headed to us or yeah, he's, he's at usc and and you would leave to go coach somewhere else so yeah i'm sure we'll hear more details but that is interesting a couple other reports multiple candidates and field expected to be the top of the list but nothing imminent at this particular time when we come back again we'll talk to uconn man they've been a wrecking machine dave borges will have one of the great college basketball analysts in john fanta at four o'clock today sam Kahn at 5 15 and john McLean, hall of fame columnist Craig's going to leave a couple of different times because of Baylor football, Baylor spring practice, and also post-practice interviews. This is 365 Sports. So uh, Stonewood Dental, Robinson, Texas. My dentist is Dr. Steve Childress. He's done an amazing job. I've told that story many times. Went to him right before COVID. Have seen him on many occasions when it comes to helping make up for lost time. Helping for bad habits that I had, including, and both Craig and Paul know this, I used to just like always have lozenges in my mouth. I used to always, I had them to what I thought would help soothe my throat, but the whole time I'm doing that, guess what I was also doing? I was also putting sugar throughout my dental work. Oh my God, you can't do that. You just can't. You could have sweets and sugar, whatever, but you I mean, I would have six or eight of them in my mouth. I'm not kidding. And they would just sit there sometimes right after a broadcast, right after a show. When it, I just did. And it came back to haunt me. Lost two teeth in my front right, lost one in my back right, bottom lower, uh, a molar, and also have one in my back left that had to be replaced. That's my fault. Dr. Steve Childress predicted all of that. It happened. Not like he wanted to go in there and take care of it and do it. Uh, and say, hey, well, let me just pull a tooth. I had to. 
I had to get that done. I had to take care of a, a couple of root canals. That's what he did. He gave me a game plan. It has worked. I am so happy that I found him and now work with him. Dr. Steve Childress in uh, Stonewood Dental in Robinson, Texas. Car's price right, day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks will feel red, white, and blue. Average your car in Texas. Cars that zoom with lots of room. Average your car in Texas. Count on us, a dealer to trust. Average your car in Waco. Let the journey to financial brilliance begin with Genco's limited time offers. Max your earnings with a Kasasa cash account and get paid monthly with a 4.25 APY. That's $425 annually. Then invest in a 13-month share certificate and earn 4.9 APY. That's $529. Earn cash and outshine the rest. At Genco, we offer you the sun and the moon. Kasasa based on average daily balance of $10,000. Certificate based on $10,000 investment. See GencoFCU.org for details. NCUA. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness on Lakeshore Drive is a premier elite life-changing experience where you can change your mind, body, and soul. Offering over 50 group exercise classes every week, including boot camp, bar, silver sneakers, and 10 cycling classes with morning and evening classes available. New state-of-the-art bikes that allow you to compete against yourself with a screen monitoring your speed, miles, resistance, and power. Personal training with Christy London, Randall Corley, Alex Botts, and Nathan where you will be encouraged and motivated to grow, losing inches in weight the right way. There's a kids club included with your membership, plus sauna and tanning bed. 16 tennis courts, plus a beautiful stadium court and longtime youth tennis pro Britt Coleman and assistant junior pro Kenna. Adult tennis lessons and clinics with Blake and the commitment to pickleball with eight courts and instructor Jody Thurman. Visit the website at wacotennis.com next to Hawaiian Falls on Lakeshore Drive in Waco. Automatic Chef Canteen is a full-service micro-market vending and office coffee provider with state-of-the-art vending equipment, a wide variety of products, and offering custom-fitted micro-market vending office coffee solutions for your employee break room. You want a full break room solution and a workplace oasis? Well, Automatic Chef Canteen, locally owned and operated for over 50 years in Central Texas, also includes in-house mechanics on call 24-7 for fast, reliable service and maintenance. Automatic Chef Canteen, 6900 Imperial Drive in Waco or online at automaticchefcanteen.com. Baylor Scott and White Southwest Sports Medicine Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike. Whether it's knee or shoulder pain, a wrist injury, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trust. Baylor Scott and White Southwest Sports Medicine Orthopedics wants to get you back in the game. This is 365 Sports. The 3 o'clock hour is sponsored by Waco Custom Marketplace. Meats, sweets, Texas treats, and a cut above the rest. 425 Lake Air Drive, Waco. UConn is rolling along, trying to defend the national title. 18-2 and two in the Big East. We know how great that conference was, and they are hammering people in the tournament so far. And, uh, of course, uh, joined by Dave Borges of CT Insider, covers UConn with us on 365 Sports. It's not like the entire season's been easy because they have a couple of losses that were one-sided. But, Dave, for the most part, has this not been a cakewalk but a pretty simple year for them? It's just a matter of them now peaking at the right time? It's been pretty amazing. Yeah, they, you know, they won it all last year, of course, and, you can make the argument that they've been better, even better this year. They um, last year they went through a stretch in January where they lost six out of eight games. This year, they at one point they went two months without losing. So um, yeah, they've lost three games, two of them in conference, one of them at Kansas uh, by four points, which is always a tough place to play. And they had some injury issues as well. So um, it's been uh, yeah, like you said, nothing's easy, especially in the Big East. But they've kind of made it look easy for most of the season. 
Dave, last year, I, uh, you know, after they win, you kind of look back and go, oh, they were a one seed that was masquerading as a, as a lower seed because of January and all that that went down. This year, there's no masquerade anymore like you just mentioned. Uh, how much of that was just built off the momentum of winning and knowing that they could do it and not really being afraid of anybody anymore? Yeah, I think, you know, when you make a run like they did, when, you know, winning their, their six tournament games by an average of 20 points, um, all by double digits. And then uh, I think that obviously you win a championship, you have a lot of confidence, but they, they lost a lot of good players to um, graduation and to the NBA. So, uh, you know, the returning players certainly had a lot of confidence, but you have, you know, five really good freshmen coming in and, and um, you know, a transfer, you know, a couple of transfers, one in particular, Cam Spencer, who, um, you know, came from Rutgers, uh, you know, obviously not really a winning tradition. He played at Loyola, Maryland before that. So uh, the returning guys had confidence, but you had some new guys to intermingle with them. And um, and it's all worked out very well. It's, it's worked out better than anyone could have expected, except maybe Dan Hurley. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you about him. How would you describe him as a coach, a personality uh, with UConn? Uh, I'd say complicated. <laughs> uh, you know, he, he's, you see him on the sidelines and that's just, he, that's just the way he's going to be. He, you're not going to unring that bell. That's just the way he is. Um, I think he, you know, the way he goes after the ref, it's just, he can't, he can't stop that. But the thing is, you know, he, he, the, his teammates, his, the players love him. He's great to them, and he's very tough in practices, but he's their best friend during games. Uh, kind of the opposite of Jim Calhoun in that sense. And um, he's, he's, a, he's just a quirky guy, but he's not a, he's certainly not a bad guy. But, you know, some of the complaining that he does publicly about I – mean, I think he's, just, he, he has, he's trying to keep this team on edge because everything has come so easily to them, at least apparently easy. I mean, like I said, nothing's easy, but – They've made it look so easy that he has to keep finding ways to get a chip on their shoulder, whether it's the selection committee giving them a tough draw or whether it's, you know, now he's just complaining that they had to play Sunday night and now they have to be in Boston on Tuesday. Well, it's not exactly a long way to go. <laughs> he just he finds these things to keep his team on edge and to um, make an us-against-the-world mentality, and, he, and it works. Yeah, he's not uh, riding it on a horse like Paul Revere did. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's not how he's, he's going. Um, Dave, uh, Tristan Newton's been fantastic uh, this year. Uh, he is he certainly raised his profile even more. Um, his uh, is he does the team though? I mean, they've got a diverse scoring, but do they kind of go though as he goes? Yeah, you can definitely say that. Now. Um, He's terrific. You know, he probably should have been Big East Player of the Year. He's a first team All American. Um, you know, he doesn't, you watch him play, he's not like a spectacular player. He's a good shooter, not a great shooter, but he does everything. You know, he's got, he's got four career triple doubles, which is the most in UConn history, and he's only been there two seasons. Um, overall, he's their best, and most important player. But I, I think you, if you look at Donovan Kling on the seven foot two center, he's a guy that kind of, is probably the most impactful guy on the team in the sense that uh, his mere presence on the court, whether he's blocking shots or not, it, it intimidates and it influences other shots and forces teams to shoot more threes and not go into the lane. So um, Tristan's incredibly important. You know, two of his biggest games of the year have been in two of the UConn's, two of UConn's losses. So mm. that's not, you know, that's not really a, anything against Tristan, but, I think if you look at the guy who may really is the most important player, you can make an argument that it's Donovan Klingon. So if you were to say they have a, uh, an Achilles or they have any kind of potential weakness or have shown that, what would it be, if anything? You know, it's a really good question. I've tried to think of one myself. I mean, you know, they haven't shot. The foul shooting has been occasionally not great. Um, including Klingon, who has a really good-looking stroke, but only shoots about 55%. And then if you can get the big guys, Klingon and his backup, Samson Johnson, in foul trouble, that can give UConn some problems because it takes away that, <coughs> excuse me, that defensive advantage they have in the middle and makes them a different team. Um, there have been games where they've struggled rebounding a little bit. But the thing is, they have just, there's so much depth 
five five starters who are averaging double figures, two or three guys off the bench who, who can also do the same. Um, it's hard. To, you really have to get a lot of guys having a bad night at the same time. So, yeah, I don't think there's any real necessary weaknesses. But like I said, try to get some of the guys in foul trouble, particularly the big. Um, and at times, rebounding and free throw shooting have been a little bit of an issue for them. When you saw the bracket come out, obviously UConn, a, a one seed and, and a favorite by a lot of people, at least more people for them than, than pretty much anybody else. Did you see the potential rematch of the national championship game with San Diego State being in this round? I mean, it's going to be in yeah, this round, was... but did you see that as a possibility? Yeah, no, I did because um, I thought, uh, you know, I wasn't high on Auburn and, and, and Yale. I thought Yale could beat them, and they did. And then, um, you know, you got San Diego State, Yale, and um, certainly as, as you know, great a season as Yale had, uh, San Diego State was predictably the better team. So I thought there was a good chance we could have that rematch. And um, it's going to be interesting because the teams are different than last year, but there's also some similar some sameness from both teams and uh, – certainly some familiarity obviously so you go ahead paul after last year what was the nil inflection like to keep this group mostly together well oh yeah they're doing well and nil wise i know that um you know they don't do obviously have to divulge the exact figures i know Klingon in particular because he's a local guy too so he's got a lot of local um you know uh advertising and things like that uh um you know, his billboard is on the main highway here for advertising a product. I forget which one, but uh, he's, I've heard he's potentially up in seven figures in terms of the NIL stuff. The other guys are doing well. They, they, they've got some initiatives that um, are, are doing very well, much better than most of their Big East rivals. And, uh, you know, since UConn football is kind of uh, not really a thing, I mean, it is a thing, but it hasn't been very good. Um, a lot of the NIL money, uh, a lot of the NIL um, uh, emphasis is on is on men's and women's basketball. Well, yeah, with what Gino's done, and they've got Beckers and all, all the others that look like they're back on a pretty good roll. So uh, the Big East, three and zero. All three teams are still alive. Six and zero through the first couple of rounds. The ACC's eight and zero through the first couple of rounds. And there was a lot of talk about what the Big Twelve was, and they were really good. It was a battering ram, but. You look up and there's some conferences with two and this and that, but there's the Big East at three and zero. How much of a drive is that to uh, to have that so-called, as you mentioned, chip on their shoulder because of it? Because obviously Hurley's brought that up before. Yeah, I think the entire conference, everyone associated with with it, was was upset that the league only got three bids. I think there's no question. They, in my mind, they should have got at least. Five, you know, four or five. I think five would have would have worked. Six would, would have been fair. Also, um, I think think you can, you know, St. John scored ninety points on UConn in the Big East tournament, and there's no doubt in my mind that with Rick Pitino there and with some of the talent they have, they could have won a couple of games in this tournament. So, um, I think it's a it's, it's a it's a big thing. Dan Dan is very supportive of his fellow Big East teams and coaches, and. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of incentive for the league to get as many teams as they can. I mean, in theory, they could get three of the final four teams. I think it's, I think that's unlikely, but I think uh, you, I think you could see two of the half the final four field as um, Big East teams. I felt the Big 12 has been the best league in the country for the past five years or so, um, but um, I think you can make the argument that maybe this year, uh, certainly not, you know, the depth. That part of it was a problem for Big East, the Big East, but I think maybe overall the Big East had had the better league this year. All right, so Dave, uh, and, and we might have had you on when this was going on a couple of years ago with all the national realignment. Conferences are now splintered. Some are almost all but gone, and some are now big, fat, like ticks on a dog in the summertime. And there was some, at least at times, some uh, thoughts that Brett Yormark wanted to explain, expand the Big 12 because of basketball with Gonzaga. UConn was brought up. Football, not really. That didn't go over very well. And you mentioned a little bit about where they are with football. Was that or is that still any kind of a thing down the road, you think, with UConn and the Big 12 in basketball? Well, if they invited, they would they would join. There's right. no question in my mind. Now, I don't think they would just be invited for basketball. I think it would have to be for everything. I mean, they might get invited just for basketball, but I don't know if they would do that. Because football is important for a lot of reasons. And, um, 
Now, does the Big 12 want them for, for football? I, I don't think so, but um, certainly would it obviously enhance an already very good basketball league. So um, it's quieted down. It was very close, I'm told, over the summer. It, it really was close to happening. And it would have been a, obviously a travel, uh, I won't say nightmare, but a lot of logistical problems traveling-wise uh, for UConn. But it would have been more than made up for, I suppose, in the, the, the um, TV and football type money they would have had coming in. So um, now look, the ACC is a much better fit. Um, even the Big Ten probably is a better fit. So if one of these leagues, and who knows what's going to happen, maybe it comes down to just a power two, power three situation, but. If one of these leagues um, end up inviting UConn, they're, they're gone in, in a, a drop of a hat. Dave, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Dave Borges with us, the Hart Connecticut Media, uh, UC Insider with us on Connecticut. And uh, appreciate his time on a lot of stuff, UConn. And, yeah, he even mentioned the women's team, which is a part of the Sweet 16, which is like clockwork. Hurst. What did I say? Hart. Hart. Well, I mean, there's also a media outlet with iHeart, right? Yeah. Slashing, William Randolph Hart. Is, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah, slashing people yeah. all throughout. The, ba- basically, he, wor- he works for the company that was founded by the guy who invented the modern newspaper. But yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the one that was kidnapped, right? The yeah, Patty Hearst, yeah, yeah, Patty Hearst. That's back. That was one of the big stories back when I was a kid in high school. That was a big, big, big deal. All right. Um, do you have that Brandon Marcello tweet, uh, Garrett, that I sent to you? Yes. Yeah, so we-, we were discussing this. And then this kind of puts everything in perspective. What a terrible few days for Wazoo. Uh, They lost their basketball coach uh, to a departing Pac-12 school. And now their AD is leaving for rival Washington and part of reality. But they had the good news this week about the finances and the money uh, that John Wilner had as far as the settlement for Oregon State and Washington State. But, man, this has got to kick them right between the you-know-whats or in the you know watch because it's kind of reality right now with where they are. Yeah, I was seeing a few getting a hit of that copamine, and oh, we didn't really like Pet Chun anyways. You know how that old yeah. song and dance goes. Every time somebody leaves, you suddenly magically didn't like them, and maybe there were actual issues. I mean, there's probably some valid points I just haven't dug far enough into to explain why maybe it's not as huge of a loss. But I mean, just the PR part of this, the perception piece, you can't uh, you know deny how this looks and it looks like people jumping off of a a ship that's teetering right now for a much safer ship that has no issues whatsoever. And uh, I think all of us uh, would probably do the same thing that Pat Jones doing would go to the much safer job with uh, more money coming in for the programs and more high profile uh, TV spots and things like that. So, um, you know, I I guess it would probably depend on, on which Washington fate you Washington State fan you talk to, the degree to which they're upset about it. But, yeah, you can't deny that uh, despite getting the money, um, the, the the hope that that was just going to magically solve everything, having these tens of millions of dollars is, is clearly not going to uh, be the, the end-all, be-all type of an answer because of, of the defections of your basketball coach, your AD, your football coach prior to all of that. Um, so, yeah, that's that's – it's a, it's a harsh reality right now for Washington State and Oregon State, and I guess the question is, will anybody be in the same boat as them here in the, the next few years? Uh, we, we don't know. There's certainly plenty of random speculation and guesses as to what all this looks like at the end. There's so many different scenarios that I've come across and just the rabbit holes that you can fall down when it comes to uh, you know realignment discussion. and uh, Sometimes it's, it's hard to know what's what, but um, they're set up well. It's just it's not a good look for them right now, and, and there's no like real answer that appears to be around the corner to make it feel a lot better in, in the near future. All right, uh, Garrett, I just sent you a note. I want to yeah, put this up in this segment. So we've discussed with the NFL when college football opened up their doors, basically, to days that they just did not take, right? And the NFL started grabbing them. In parts of it, especially in like December and, and, and those months, even November and December, the NFL today, and Craig does not have off the radar because he's going to be at practice. I just saw this note. They've now committed to play two games on Christmas Day in the afternoon to late afternoon. It's a Wednesday. And we know what some of the players, the union, whatever, think about games on Thursday, but again, massive ratings. The league will play Saturday games in Week 16 to advance, et cetera. And John Wilner had a response to this that um, college football and men's basketball have to get creative with scheduling. The NFL is coming for every premium 
broadcast window, if not already, in captivity. Yeah, Smokey, they, they just get bigger, uh, just bigger, bigger, and bigger. They're going to expand and expand and expand. And until you know, there's something that's planted on a day, and look, college football has one random stupid bowl game on Christmas Day, usually, or sometimes not. Sometimes it's Christmas Eve and then, and then the day after. Uh, the NFL, uh, the NBA have staked out their claim to Christmas Day, no matter what day of the week it is. The thing that's going to suck is for the players, and they're going to really hate this, and it seems like the NFL does this so that whatever thing they're planning to keep the players off of it in the next negotiation – they have a Saturday game before. The teams that are going to play in the Saturday doubleheader are also going to play in the Wednesday game to keep them on that track. That's gonna they're gonna be mad about that. It's gonna be like Thanksgiving. They're not gonna they're not gonna like it. So you have that going on. It, it's just um, you know they're gonna keep getting bigger and bigger. They just expand without and, stopping. And, and you hear someone when the when the college football games are on a Thursday or a Friday or a Wednesday. And remember, I mean that's what TCU did when they were not accepted or brought into the Big 12, they would play on Wednesday nights to get some publicity and eventually, of course, had that unbeaten Rose Bowl championship team. The NFL doesn't damn care what day it is. They don't. Yeah, if it's college, open, go. College football's out there going, well, we don't want to upset the high school coaches. It's like yep. <laughs> you think the NFL's going, hey, don't want to upset the co – clearly not. They're not worried about anybody. They're just going to do what they do. Um, so, well, yeah. There's a there's – a, uh, there's a $20 million audience that right now we don't have on another day. Let's go take that day. Yeah, um, so just not surprised by that, that they're going to just keep taking over real estate. I mean, nothing's stopping them. And um, I know traditionalists will probably balk at this just the day of the week more than anything. I mean, this is Christmas Day, though, Like, so I don't take issue with that. I know it's, it's in the middle of the week, and so the turnaround and all of that's really where the conversation is. But, I mean, it's it seems like a brilliant move. I. I'd love to watch an NFL game on Christmas Day. I don't know Me about too. you guys. Me even too. if it's Wednesday, that's even yeah. better. Um, because otherwise it means we have to wait like five years to get NFL games basically mm. on, on Christmas for, you know, a Saturday, a Sunday, or a Monday. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Once you're done with everything, like especially if you're a family that doesn't have little kids that doesn't have like the big, you know, present opening extravaganza, if you're done in like an hour and then you have your meal, like what are you doing? Give me an NFL game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's as good a present as any uh, for for people at home with family, friends, whatever, watching TV on Christmas. Throw us some NFL games, absolutely. We'll devour that just like we do on Thanksgiving. And um, you know, if college was doing it, that'd be great too. But um, yeah, I just I think that that's uh, it's a sign of the times, and the NFL's continuing to find new ways to put their product out there, and they're not doing it through super expansion or anything like that. They're expanding in other ways, not you know necessarily the format or not necessarily like the conferences or the the league or anything like that. Um, just expanding their footprint across the calendar, and it seems to be working really well for them. By the way, uh, is that a wide shot? There you go, Garrett. Blue. I really, I looked this up. Blue is a primary color. Across all models of color space, it's the color of the ocean and the sky. It often symbolizes serenity, stability, inspiration, or wisdom. It can be calming, a color and symbol of reality. Well, that's why we did it. And, and look at the background behind us, Texas. Proud, the, 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 the 365 Sports has got kind of a marble blue color to it. Somebody, I think Paula brought that up, among others. And I just wanted you to know that we wanted to... Again, symbolize serenity, stability, inspiration, and wisdom. Sometimes we don't find that in the chat room. When, when I think of you, Smokey, I think of all those words. You do not. What's the opposite of serenity? Hell? Me, if I don't go to practice here pretty soon. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait, <laughs> yeah. we'll do that. What's the opposite of stability? Weakness? Yeah. Inspiration? Uh, oh, okay, Craig, you've got to go to practice. Yes. All right. When we come back in the 4 o'clock hour, John Fanta, great college basketball analyst. He'll join us. Also, Sam Kahn and TheAthletic.com, they did a podcast today on who will win uh, a Big 12, not only conference title, but who could win a national title now that Texas and Oklahoma are gone to the SEC. That probably, We'll join him uh, at 515 today. This is 365 Sports. TexasBeefHouse.com. I traded a couple of text messages today with Samantha Duvall, TexasBeefHouse.com. She's in charge of the marketing. The beef auction that's coming up is April the 25th. It's in less than a month now, a month from yesterday. April 25th. Now, remember, 
This beef auction, auction is open to everybody. You, me, anybody. You can live anywhere outside of Texas because Texas Beef House is located on the eastern part of Texas, in East Texas, just outside of Tyler, which is about a two and a half hours drive from Waco. And it's in White House, home of Patrick Mahomes. They've got an incredible ranch. They raise, farm-raised, Wagyu beef and cattle. That's what they do. Premium quality beef from their pasture to your plate. The beef auction coming April 25th. You could do it online. You could do it in person. They will have samples for you. And it is a chance for you to stock up with what you want when it comes to beef from TexasBeefHouse.com. They do have their different bundles that you can buy as well. They ship on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. Local deliveries if you're out of the East Texas area. Samantha Duvall and also Aaron, the Duvall family and great people at TexasBeefHouse.com. Pizza, burgers, and Bears football. There's no place around Waco that serves them all other than Bubba's 33. Come show your green and gold and enjoy some of Waco's best food and beverages while watching your favorite team, the Bears. When real Bears fans get hungry, Bubba's 33 is the number one spot for ice-cold drinks, hand-stretched, stone-baked pizzas, and bacon-infused burgers. Join us for indoor or patio dining. Bubba's 33, Waco's restaurant and proud supporter of Baylor Bears football. Sick em, Bears. Riverbend Liquor and Wine now has two locations to serve you. The original on Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street and the brand new spot in downtown Waco at 600 Franklin Avenue. If you're looking for the best in craft beers or local Texas bourbons, then the original is the place to be. And for the latest trends and online phenomenons, head downtown to the Franklin location. Either way, you're going to get the same great variety, customer service, and speedy experience. Check out both locations on their Facebook and Instagram pages. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street, and now downtown on Franklin Avenue. Samantha Duvall, TexasBeefHouse.com with me, David Smoke. And tell you what, you guys keep rolling along. You do have yet another date, correct, for an online and live auction. Yes, our next online and live auction will be Thursday, April 25th. We've discussed how this has been unique and how people have reacted to it. Has that momentum continued as you've done more? Yes, it's kind of half and half. We'll have a good amount of people there that are from the area. And then we have probably 40% that we we ship out and everybody that I've delivered locally to has talked about how much fun they had and they want to know when the next one's going to be. We've gotten great feedback from the people that we've shipped to. They're all just so excited about this event and they can't wait for the next one to happen. Premium grade East Texas beef. Customers don't have to go out and buy their beef. TexasBeefHouse.com from their family and their ranch to your plate. TexasBeefHouse.com. Texas Farm Bureau Insurance has been proudly serving Texans across the state for over 60 years. Call 254-772-8090 to find an agent who will provide a free review of your auto, home, and life coverage. This is 365 Sports. The Sikkim 365 app is brought to you by Alan Samuels Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram Fiat. Come by, let's be friends. He is as good as it gets when it comes to covering basketball, college basketball. John Fanta joins us from the field of 68 right here on 365 Sports and also college basketball on Fox, broadcaster, reporter, and more. Thanks for your time, John. We always love your work. Appreciate what you do. So uh, we're down to 16, and there's just the one double seed, of course, with uh, NC State and what run they've been on. Can you try to uh, explain what they've done and we're used to people slipping into the Sweet 16. They're a big boy school and a program, but your thoughts about what they've done? Yeah, what NC State has done is is amazing, guys. I mean, it, it, this is a program that 17 days ago was 17 and 14. It's great to be with you guys, by the way. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Seven, 17 and 14, not even three weeks ago. I think Kevin Keith is going to get fired. And 17, in, in a span of 13 days, Kevin Keith went from being fired, from being in the hot seat, to a king waiting on a pretty contract extension. Uh, it's amazing. And it is it epitomizes March. They've won seven in a row. DJ Burns is one of the best stories in this tournament. Six foot nine, 275 pounds. Uh, he's a, he's a, a ballerina that's sized like a vending machine. And <laughs> this guy is just playing at another level. 16 and a half points 
close to five rebounds per game during the seven-game stretch. D.J. Horn has been terrific. They have scoring balance, which they always had. But now, you know, you get to the tournament, and I think certain teams come out tight, right? And they just don't look themselves. Uh, I felt that even this past weekend when Tennessee was playing Texas. I thought at times Tennessee was playing way too tight, uh, and they escaped. But for me, this NC State team, they've got nothing to lose. And they never had anything to lose. And when they do lose, and I think they'll lose this weekend, nobody's going to bat an eye. They're going to say, what a run. What a remarkable run this team went on. Uh, so what are they getting? They're getting great contributions from Horn, uh, from Mohamed Diara, who's been terrific, and then Burns inside. Michael O'Connell's done enough. They just have different guys who can get them 10 to 12 points per game. Makes it tougher for you to scout. They're playing at a nice tempo. They're getting high-quality shots, and it's allowing them to be in in games when, you know, they're not the Cinderella. They're a high major. Uh, But I think for Kevin Keats, it was like, look, guys, we can either make something of this or we can go down and and, uh, lose in the ACC tournament. Nobody will think anything of it. And I think he's got a veteran group. His group is experienced, and they played like it. Yeah, how how often do you think that – they have an assistant coach spray Dave Dorr and the football coach with water to keep him out of the basketball facility to keep him away from T.J. Burns. <laughs> I know. I mean, he belongs on an offensive line. He really does. He has been absolutely terrific. He really has been. So, I mean, yeah, I would take him. i take him on my football team. He, he's been nailed, guys. He's been terrific. Now, the question is, how... Does NC State play Marquette, who has a five-man in Oso Agadaro, who is literally the antithesis of Burns from a style standpoint? I do not think that, that NC State can have Burns guard Igadaro. That's just a, a, a physical mismatch because of the size compared to the, the angular length? Yeah. It's the, it's the total differences in their skill sets. Burns is this huge Tonka truck. Igadaro's Mr. Mobility. Mm-hmm. He's mobile. He can run the floor. He's great in the lane. He's great on those hook shots. I think Marquette is a problem matchup for NC State. I expect Marquette to win. John, I don't remember. Uh, it it might have been back. I mean, uh, I'm 65 in May, but there was always Al McGuire, the great Al McGuire Marquette, speaking of that. Uh, used to mention that for a team to win the national title, very few just like run through the tournament. And we've seen that yeah. more often than not. But you had to have one of those moments, a, a tipping at the buzzer, a last-second shot. Uh, Houston had that with A&M. I mean, that thing yes, was dicey. Did. Um, does that – some people go, well, they show – does that, does that kind of lead to, okay, they've had their scare. That doesn't mean there won't be any more close games. But is that something you almost need to see, even if it's not fun to be a part of it? Yeah, you have to. You have to. Al McGuire said that. Jay Wright said it when he was going on his title runs in 2016 and 18. I mean, if Chris Jenkins doesn't make the shot, we go to overtime and perhaps Carolina wins. They had the momentum at that point. Here's the deal. You've got to get lucky at times. For Houston, they're so tough defensively, but on that night, on Sunday night, the officials were calling it tight. And A&M shot 45 free throws. A&M should be kicking themselves. They only made 29 of them. But sometimes you do catch a break. When you're playing, I, I say to people this, it's not one six-game tournament. It's six one-game tournaments hmm. for the winner. You, you're in a one-game playoff every time. It's why we love this thing. And it's also why it's hard for Cinderella to win this thing because of that. It's hard for the Cinderella to have their, their absolute best for six straight games. It's why the Sweet 16 is better set up for heavyweight matches than for, for it's the Sweet 16 of David, uh, or rather of Goliath, not David. Um, you know, I think that for Houston, they, they've got an incredible backcourt in Shed, Sharp, and Cryer, uh, with, with Emmanuel Sharp coming off a 30 point showing, uh, against Texas A&M. My issue with A&M, and I'm worried about it against Duke, is, Kyle Filipowski is going to be the best front court player in that game, and Duke has a hot backcourt right now. Jared McCain is shooting the basketball as well as anybody left in this tournament. 30 points on Sunday against a good James Madison team. 
My issue with Houston is they need those top three to be great offensively for them to beat an elite team. There's not a lot of room for air for them. But you know what? There was room for air for them Sunday night and they escaped. And so for that reason, your question's very well taken in that if Houston's in this Final Four, which I picked Houston to go to the Final Four, we will look back on that round of 32 game and say, what could have been? John, uh, how do you grade? Is it fair to grade conferences by their performance in the tournament? Or is that maybe a confusing metric because – this thing is about matchups and who you who you draw. You know, look, if Kentucky gets any other 14 seed, they might win in a walk, but they got Oakland. You know, uh, same with Auburn and Yale. Like, what uh, what is uh, what is your grading of how a conference performs and what their value is? Yeah, you have to put the whole body of work with with what they do in this tournament, but you can't form your whole opinion off of a one game tournament. That's not that's not right, and it also, it, as someone who covers this sport year round, guys, it defeats the purpose of the whole season if I literally do everything off of one or two games. I know that the casual fan is going to do that. I get it, I get it. It's like what they think of a team in the NFL, whether they can win a playoff game or not. I mean, the Buffalo Bills have been one of the National Football League's best teams in recent years, but guess what? In the playoffs, they've stunk. So now do we think that they're a bad organization? Of course we don't. But do they have their flaws? Yes. You could say both are true at the same time. Um, when I package this together and take a look at, at conference records, right? The ACC, the back half of the ACC right now has no identity. None. you got a lot of programs that are dead weight. Louisville's never been worse. Um, Georgia Tech is, is kind of dead weight. Uh, it doesn't feel like, like Wake Forest is getting as close as they can, but it just feels like something's missing there. I can go right down the line. The, the Big East, the same thing. Georgetown is so far from what they've been. Um, Xavier had their first losing season since the 90s. DePaul is horrendous. Like there's some dead weight in some of these leagues. So then when they're, when some of these teams are winning tournament games now, do you say their league is the best? Their league is the best. The best conference in college basketball is the Big 12. It is. It analytically is, but the Big 12 is seven and six in this tournament. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there were some programs in the Big 12 that, that did not do a great job scheduling in non conference beat each other up in league play. And now they're here. And some of them were early exits as a result. Did we overvalue the Big 12 a little bit? Perhaps, but we can't control it. If Kansas was fully healthy and had Kevin McCullough, I really believe that they're here. I do. I believe they're in this Sweet 16. Circumstances happen, guys. Circumstances occur. NC State, um, you look at their past, you know, they, they were able to play Oakland in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Um, like, it's no disrespect to Oakland, but that's your that's your uh, your pathway after beating a very good Texas Tech team. But you get my point. We could go right down the line. San Diego State, you know, San Diego State comes into this tournament and they beat UAB, a team that I you know wouldn't have been in otherwise had they not stolen a bid. And Yale, who played a great Auburn team, and you could tell they played a great Auburn team because it took everything out of them to beat Auburn. So there's there's different rhyme or reason to how this tournament goes. It shouldn't form everything. It's a feather in the cap to the ACC. We knew Duke and Carolina were great. I thought Clemson was better than their seed, and it showed. But because the Big East has three teams that combined to go 6-0, and does that now mean the Big East is the best college basketball league? It does not mean that. It does mean, though, to me, that the committee did a, a poor job overall of selecting this field because this is my last point here, and I'm sorry for the long-windedness. In my opinion, we have a Sweet 16 that's top-heavy because the committee did not do a great job in the back end of this bracket with their protocols for teams. Well, it, that brings me to, John, the, the thoughts about expanding the tournament, more teams, et cetera. And it, it all just depends on who you ask based on what they really want to do. What say you? The committee has a hard enough time fielding 68. Now we're going to put the hands of 80 teams in their in their hands. I mean, they're they're having trouble doing 68 teams. I I, I am vehemently against vehemently against expanding the NCAA tournament. 
It is the best postseason in sports. It does produce Cinderella stories. Oakland pulled that off over Kentucky. Yale pulled that off over Auburn. James Madison stormed past Wisconsin. We do not need to be talking about 500 teams and whether or not they belong in the NCAA tournament. College basketball's regular season has a hard enough time being relevant in December, January, and February. This topic fires me up, if you couldn't tell. And I really dislike the football people, you know who they are, Mm -hmm. trying to insert themselves in a discussion that they have no leg to stand on. And you cannot tell me that it's coincidence that the Southeastern Conference went five and six during the first weekend of the NCAA tournament and had a massive flop. So I don't want to hear it anymore. These These ideas and theories about expanding it only benefit more mediocre high majors. Forget it. We should not expand the NCAA tournament. You know what's going to happen when we expand the NCAA tournament? More coaches are going to lose their jobs, even if they make the NCAA tournament. Because it's going to be so diluted that that's not going to be a proper reward. People are going to want you to win a tournament game. Think about that. The coaches who are advocating for tournament expansion, be careful what you wish for. It just further dilutes everything that you do. I am not a fan of tournament expansion. I think it only benefits the football commissioners who want to make a couple more units. You know how you make tournament units? You win games. The SEC missed the boat on that. Other leagues did not. I don't want to hear from Greg Sankey about why he wants to do this or that. Stay in your lane with football. Avoid basketball. Uh, I, I wish he'd stay less in the lane with football, uh, quite frankly, because he's uh, kind of autocratically doing things, John. And, and um, it's like, you know, you mentioned the coach getting fired. It's like, uh, well, I made the Bahamas Bowl. Well, we don't pay you to make the Bahamas Bowl. We pay you to right. w- to win more. Yeah, it's it, it's a problem. And to me, you mentioned the the regular season has enough trouble drawing eyes when there's a lot of great stuff that goes on in the regular season. Even in November when they have these tournaments, when you've got, you know, Duke playing Michigan or, you know, Michigan State and Kansas or Baylor and Gonzaga and all these great things early on, they need to highlight yeah. that stuff more. That way when they get into the conference season, which most of these conferences are pretty good, uh, whether you're a power four in football or not, you've got a lot of great conferences that the network's really aren't pushing enough to get enough eyes on on them at all yeah i i totally agree and you know i don't know how you guys feel about college basketball in general but i can tell you right now january and february in this sport has become so much fun every Mm -hmm. night something happens the bubble talk is real Mm -hmm. Um, you see drama emerge you know i i can't wait i mean as someone who covers this sport closely I think we could be in for our greatest Sweet 16 in over a decade. Uh, I just think that there's so many great teams here that are left standing. All the teams that we talked about all year between Zach Eady and Purdue, Connecticut's greatness. We just talked about Houston. We can go right down the line to Carolina, to Creighton, to Tennessee with Dalton Connect. Like The matchup between Dalton Connect and Baylor Shireman in Tennessee Creighton is absolutely terrific hoop. We could get the Caleb Love Bowl this weekend between oh. Arizona and North and North Carolina. Like, but that's all developed off the off the transfer portal and off the regular season. Uh, that 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 all builds. And I do think college basketball. You know, whereas in college football, these past couple of years, we get to week seven or eight, and all anybody wants to talk about on a debate show is who the top four are going to be, who's going to make the playoff, who's going to make the playoff. Right now in college basketball. What's great about this tournament is it's not limited to one area of the country. We're talking about teams from all over the nation, east, west, south, north, and you're going to see this weekend these teams keep vying for a prize in one-game playoff situations. I I think the state of college basketball is in a great place. Uh, There are some things that need to get shifted, but this tournament should never. Well, and you think about this when we, we look at the, the mid-majors or so-called Cinderella's. There was a time when Gonzaga was a Cinderella. Uh, Creighton's no got a really good uh, basketball history, and they're trying to get back to another uh, deep run and and, uh, and love what Coach McDermott did. They dismissed the Baylor last year in the second round. Uh, it, I love what you're saying because we've, we've all said the same thing, not just that we – Brought you on because I did not know your take on that. I do get to watch some of your segments with Goodman and Douster and others too. But, yeah, why mess something that's so good just because maybe there's more money? I guess mm-hmm. that's the way it is. Yeah. 
If you, if, if you look at the 16, John, John Fanta, the field of 68, also college basketball analyst uh, as well, and broadcaster, you have the NC State, that's a that's the kind of a Cinderella, but still a, a basketball school. You have a For six sure. a, a six Clemson and a five San Diego State. Hey. Uh, yes. Do do you have is there a is there a Cinderella other than North Carolina State or is everybody oh. pretty much yeah. There's not a Cinderella, but it makes for a better second weekend. Right. It may, you know, Cinderella's only great until the magic runs out and she gets blown out by 30 in the Elite Eight. Mm-hmm. And then it produces less viewers there, and it produces a potential dud. Um, it, we had a mix. We had first-round upsets. We had Yale. We had Oakland. We had James Madison. We had a couple others that emerged. But I said this before, and I'll say it again. The committee put six Mountain West teams in mostly because they beat each other. That's a mistake. You've got to evaluate who you're beating. You've got to evaluate non-conference scheduling. You've got to do a better job because Virginia did not belong in the NCAA tournament. They didn't. And now looking back at it, Clemson Clemson blew the doors off New Mexico, who stole a bit. They were not going to be in. Mm -hmm. But Boise State, no show their tournament game. I, I just... I think that we've got to evaluate better as a whole with the bottom. But that's part of the reason why when you're saying, is there a Cinderella? Cinderella's carriage is not pulling up to this Sweet 16. But I'm telling you, I think it makes for some better matchups across the board. Houston and Duke. Duke's got one of the best backcourts in the country. Houston does too. Uh, we, we get uh, Clemson, we get uh, Creighton in Tennessee. You know, we get Purdue and Gonzaga. Yeah. Like, Gonzaga is no longer a Cinderella. You know why? They've been to nine straight Sweet 16s. That's the longest streak in college basketball. We get Iowa State versus Illinois. Iowa State has the best defense in the country. Illinois has the best offense in the country. So I'm telling you guys, I I know we don't have the 13 or 14. I would have liked to see one Cinderella. We don't have that, but I do think it's going to make for better all-around matches. I think you will wake up on Friday after the first day of the Sweet 16 saying, man, I can't wait for what tonight holds because uh-huh. that was pretty wild last night. That felt like a Final Four game, but it was played during the Elite Eight or Sweet 16. John, uh, would you care to take a swipe at the Louisville coaching job and what they're going to do there? Because um, it feels like they doubled down on getting Scott Drew, which was a mistake because he wasn't leaving Baylor. Uh, and then now, like it seems like their field is drying up a little bit. Yeah, I, I do think that their that their field has dried up a little bit. I also I also wonder uh, if Josh Schertz is emerging here, the Indiana State coach who's still in the NIT. You know, for me, like Pat Kelsey's on the radar from Charleston. Well, if Pat Kelsey was the guy, wouldn't you have hired him by now? Richard Pitino has emerged on their list. Uh, I think that, the, and that would be fascinating. Although <laughs> I just don't, I don't see how Louisville can hire a Patino. I, I, that that to me seems like it's too far fetched. Maybe I'll be wrong and eat my words. Richard had nothing to do with the Rick Louisville era, other than the fact that, well, he is his son. Uh, but but we'll see. I I uh, I do think Louisville's at a crossroads. It's not going to be Scott Drew. It was never going to be Scott Drew. I think this. You know what this says to me, guys? That. Louisville is no longer a blue blood program. It's no longer a top 10 job. It's a passionate fan base. It's a, it's a quality job, but there's been so much damage. There's, this is like, here's what I like in it too, right? You guys in your neighborhood or area, is there a, is there an establishment? There's gotta be an establishment. I won't name any names to call anybody out. 25 years ago, they made the be- they had the best food, the best of the best. And the place is still around, but the place has gotten lapped. And they're still trying to be open for business because of who they were 25 years ago. And they're no longer that. They're no longer that. You can't do things. You can't be the same who you've been forever. And it just, I get an Oakland, now Vegas Raiders vibe from Louisville. I think the brand is big. I think the fan base is huge, but I think their dysfunction speaks for itself. 
And I think that anybody who's, who's looking at this job, who's currently got a nice job, is too afraid of doing what Chris Mack did. Chris Mack left Xavier, a, a very nice job, for Louisville. And within three, four years, it didn't matter that at one point his team was going to be a, you know, was one of the best teams in college basketball. It ended. It ended over drama and dysfunction and just a lack of building culture. It, it is a massive rebuild there. And if you're Duke, Kentucky, or Carolina, and that job opened, even if you were at your worst, it wouldn't be looked at as a massive rebuild. We should never look at a top 10 job as a massive rebuild. To me, Louisville is now a large rebuild and something that other high major coaches don't want any part of because of the scars they've seen from their colleagues. When the Drew speculation, which was mainly made from somebody obviously leaked it, the Louisville media, I could see why they would love that. Uh, I sent a note to an administrator at Baylor, and the response to me was, "This is no. if this was 10 years ago, if this was 2012 or 13 or whatever, then maybe Scott at least looks. But now he's built what is, even though the last three years have ended quickly, he has built what is a brand new arena that he helped build, and then obviously the national title and his recruiting is great right now too. So Louisville and men's basketball, and I, this pains me because I'm a Nebraska guy. Are they Nebraska in in basketball? What Nebraska yeah. is in football? Yeah, it feels that way. It yeah. really does. Because because again, there's a following. They rate on. Well, I will say this: TV executives tell me there's a bit of apathy in terms of their viewership. Like it's one of those things where yeah, the brand is there, but it's kind of got Georgetown to it. Mm -hmm. Like oh, it's yeah. been a while since they've been good. Yeah. Georgetown's the same way. Like we talk about these schools and what they're known for. And that, like the Patino era seems so far ago in in Louisville. Think about this. You know why it seems so far ago? It wasn't that long ago. It's been in the last decade that he was the coach there. When when they play their first game next season, they will have now had six different head coaches between interims. And those interims, like David Padgett served a full season. They will have had six different coaches lead their team, go to press conference, represent their program in the last nine years. Yeah, you can't do you can't you cannot have instability and and it hey I gotta ask you one more thing. John, you've given us more time than we asked for, but we appreciate it. I saw the interview pinned at your Twitter feed or X with uh, Bill Murray. How much fun was that to have a chance to visit with him about a year ago? The best. The best. He he was awesome to visit with. He told me a story, uh, you know, story about being a dad. He said he wasn't always the best dad. Uh, but he's making up for it now with his kids. His son Luke is on the UConn staff, was at Xavier, but now on the UConn staff, doing a great job with Dan Hurley. Uh, I think Bill was getting ready to go to a birthday party in Vegas that was going to go till about 4 a.m. He told me to get a chicken fried steak in Texas, not a country fried steak, a chicken fried steak. And he was just hysterical. <laughs> he, had me, he had me laughing. He was a great guy. I think he's very misunderstood. Uh, I kind of walked up to him and said, Hey, Bill, do you have a moment for me? And he didn't even flinch. He goes, sure. Uh, I think a lot of people have seen him as a different type of guy. You know, apparently he's been a bit abrasive in the past to certain folks. I could tell you my interaction with Bill Murray, uh, you know, they say never meet the stars. I met a star. I thought he was awesome. He couldn't have been nicer to me, and I love talking with him. Uh, he's one of my favorites ever. I know Paul's too. And, and he's been to Waco to watch Baylor yeah. uh, a handful hey, of times. John, I was, let's see, Smokey and I probably had a streak of, at that point, like all of the home games minus maybe one or two, and Xavier rolls in to play Baylor, and we're on the road doing something, and Bill Murray's yeah, there. Yeah, and he's sitting I was that. so yeah. – we were eating dinner that night, and they, like, keep showing him – at well, we're at the sports bar. They keep showing him. And I'm like, I'm here at the stupid whatever we're at. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, we were probably at uh, – I don't know where we were. I don't, I don't know. know we were. We were somewhere. Maybe at a, a Super Bowl. John, yeah. you're the best, man. Thank you for your insight. I love the transparency and how you bust it for Fox Sports, also the field as well. Uh, of 68 with Goody and, and, and Rob and them. Great job. Thanks for your time, and, and enjoy the rest of the tournament. I know you will. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate you. Enjoy the madness. Always fun joining you. Have a great night. Man, I love John Fanta. I love it. And he, he's on. 
He college basketball on Fox, broadcaster, reporter. He covers the Big East, host of the Big East shoot around, commentary on the field of 68 with Douster and Goodman and others, Go oh, Oglesby. I so good. absolutely love Look, listening the, to him. Uh, and, and this is not an indictment of anybody. Like, we have Kevin Flaherty on. Like, this is, if I am ranking the like, college basketball, you know, pundits and guys who know, like, he right now and We've had Rob on a lot and, and all these guys. To me, Fance is number one right now. You just heard that. Like, he is the dude. He can talk about everybody. Yep. He, he is. He reminds, like, his knowledge. Yeah, he could talk about not just Gonzaga because they've been. He could talk about Gonzaga as much as Seton Hall, as much as Louisville, as much as New Mexico. Yeah. Do you know who, like, that reminded me of was when Peter Gammons was the main baseball guy at ESPN in the 90s. There was nothing Peter Gammons didn't know. Like, mm -hmm. there was nothing, whether it was – he was obviously really plugged in with the Red Sox. He's from Boston, which is why I started liking him. But, like, the, if, if the Padres and Mariners made a trade, he knew it all. He knew it yep. all. Yep. And, and, and look, that's uh, – and also, to credit a guy who's just retired, he's got, like, Norm Hitz because fans has got Norm Hitz. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah he level. Coop. Coop. No, Coop, Coop. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, Coop, yeah. It'd be a good thing to maybe get him on too in between his Mavericks broadcast. The NBA's got about 10 or 12 games left in their regular season Then all of a sudden, uh, are you wearing an LSU Tigers hat again today? Yeah. Can we out. can we kind of calm that down a little bit? <laughs> Why? Yeah, no. Well, I got, I got both two of them. I mean, yeah. is is that is that to support football or Kimmy? Uh, I would say football. It's baseball, man. It's baseball. Oh, no, yeah. Tanks. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. just unbelievable. Yeah. I saw I saw LSU in Florida. Baseball kind of caught a part of that game. Yeah. Well, that that was yeah. intense. Hey. They, they they play at a, at a level that's sheesh. Yeah. a little different. Guess yeah. guess who beat Florida two weeks ago? Florida State. Did they really? Yeah, know? they're they're playing well. They I mean they took their first. They were nineteen and zero rolling into Clemson this week. Didn't roll out. <laughs> they didn't roll out undefeated. Clemson's number four in the country for a reason, but uh, yeah, they were they're they're to link. Jarrett's got them got them rolling along. So yeah, some uh, of you uh, uh, don't like some of John's opinions, uh, good. and some of you absolutely love his good. opinions. You know what? That's great because great. one of the things for those of you who may have just picked us up today. Uh, by the way, hit the like and subscribe button, please, if you don't mind, and if you haven't told somebody about who we are, what we do, then we hope you will so we can inc increase uh, what we have as far as uh, uh, the amount of subscribers. Um, we are approaching our fourth year on the year. Did you realize that? Yeah. Coming no, up it's, on uh, April the 6th. It'll, it'll 10, be a weekend. 10 days or it'll be a weekend. That sucks. Yeah. So we'll have a cookie cake maybe the day before. Um, but uh, we appreciate that. One of the things that we have always tried to do, and like, for example, we might have somebody on that's a little critical about – uh, Baylor or some school, and we'll, we'll inevitably get a text or a, a whatever like, man, why do you have this guy or girl on? Our job is not to tell you how you should think like we see too much now in news. Our job is to give you different options, different angles, different opinions, and we know you're smart enough to be able to figure it out so you can form your own opinion. I've always had that philosophy, and we hope that you enjoy that. When we come back, much more to get to. I I have some interesting Dak Prescott news. All right, we'll get to we Dak Prescott to, we news. We need to discuss. Um, is that with his agent being snapped? No. Okay, we'll it's, come back. Uh, oh, is that that very, lawsuit? It's a very, no. It's a very bold decision by Jerry and the Cowboys. You know what? Good for them. Best ownership and personnel football history franchise, five Super Bowls. It's been that way I mean, for 26 years. Look. Are they not going to extend his contract? That appears that right, that's... Let's what... yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll come back with that. I, I, uh, I can't wait. I saw where his agent got slapped with a fine by the NFL Players Association. Well, the, this is good. It's, it's good news for the Cowboys because based on this news, they might have to talk to him ever again. Uh, <laughs> we'll come back more. Uh, here's some of the responses. We'll come back with some of your... Thoughts and comments in the chat room, too, in between some of the uh, just constant flare-ups. It's so much fun. It is a daycare in the middle of a show. This is 365 Sports. Pioneer Steel and Pipe. Build it with steel. Metal shops to beautiful barn dominiums. 
any type of metal project you have, they are there to help you make it perfect. They have pipe, they have steel, they have metal, they have heavy duty products. I, I, if you go to their website, pioneerboys.com, and one of the pictures on the front page is a barn dominium, a, a, a house, two story home, a balcony on the top, and it's just gorgeous pool, landscaping, got a shop in an area off to the side, and it's all with product from Pioneer Steel and Pipe. Brand new location on Loop 340, Highway 6. Been there now for, what, 15, 16 months. 1943, they opened up their doors. 1943, and they are bigger, better, faster, and stronger tradition, experience that serves you. Pioneer Boys, no matter what you call them, you call them stable, you call them versatile. You call them, the, they've been able to fight through the big box scores that go into a lot of cities and eat up local companies because they can have more and cost less. No. Pioneer Steel and Pipe continues to thrive because they will do it, well, the old-fashioned way. You can shake people's hands. You can be your best friend with a customer and vice versa. But you still have to have great product and service, and they do, at PioneerBoys.com. It's Dodge Power Shot Days at Allen Samuels in Waco. Experience the adrenaline-pumping performance and cutting-edge technology of Dodge. From the sleek and stylish 2023 Charger to the performance and muscle of a Challenger to the bold and rugged Durango. During Dodge Power Shot Days, we're offering amazing deals and special incentives that will make driving a new Dodge even more exhilarating. Don't miss out on these exclusive savings. Visit Allen Samuels in Waco today and unleash the power of Dodge. Come by. Let's be friends. You want to know why Stonewood Dental is so successful? Listen to what happy customers have to say. It's pleasant. It's different than any other dentist's office. I really feel like they care. And it's not that you're here for two hours waiting on someone to take care of you. It's quick and easy, and, you know, I bring my kids, and my kids love being here, too. They really love the treasure box. <laughs> Staff is really nice and accommodating, real friendly. You feel more like home. It's not sterile looking. Everybody has their own personalized rooms with decorations and decor, and they'll even have a blanket for you when it's cold. <laughs> I've recommended people to actually come here, and they are patients now. I really love it here. It feels like family. Learn more, stonewood-dental.com. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. TFNB Your Bank for Life is the official local bank of Baylor Athletics. Find out why more Central Texans are making TFNB their bank for life. Sign up for our Edge checking and savings accounts to earn interest or cash back. With five convenient locations and an award-winning mobile app, banking has never been easier. TFNB Your Bank for Life. Member FDIC. is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. The 4 o'clock hour is sponsored by Boozer's Jewelers, the wedding ring store, specializing in custom jewelry and repair, all in-house. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. Craig is at Baylor Spring Drills at football practice uh, about a mile from here inside. or I don't know if they're in the indoor or not or outside. They so much construction going on over there. What they've done to the indoor that's now hooked in and wrapped around with a football ops building that will open up, pretty amazing. <laughs> pretty darn amazing. And uh, I was there the other day. Parking's a nightmare, but that's okay. Progress is more important. You know what um – uh, when they first built it, stuck out to me was that it, the field wasn't 100 yards. And I thought, well, for the indoor, they don't really. They don't like, it, it, I just lost. Am I there? Yeah, so did I. Okay, no, there you go. Okay, sorry. Yeah, like the field wasn't 100 uh, like it 
uh, it wasn't. It's quite, not a hundred yards. It, it wasn't a hundred like yards. Eighty-seven. It's like eighty. It's like there's a okay. couple. So when they a lot of early on, the indoor facilities were like fifty. Yeah. So it wasn't a hundred yards. So then that was part of the expansion of it and all that was to add a hundred yards. And I just thought like, eh, that's weird, you know. But again, when you're in the indoor, you're just in the building. Like the the spread out drills that you would do like on the outside, like you're not going to do that day. Like that's a different thing. But now that it's 100 yards, but even still, like in the outside, they have a whole bunch more. And, um, you know, I know that there's days where like they practice in and out depending on what they're doing. And they just kind of roll through and, and do all that. So, yeah, it's uh, I can't wait to see what it looks like. It's going to be great. Um, great, great, great over there. It, so. is, it is just, I mean, it's a mess. Mm -hmm. And it's all it's it's good though it's it's, it's progress as I said we're going to get to the Dak Prescott uh, note in just a moment. What did J G Neolardo say a minute? Ago? Oh, about me. So by the way, Paul Catalina I'm, is not a Houston no. hater for picking Houston so, to lose. Everyone has their own thoughts on outcomes. There's a movement among people that starts on the triple option and then carries over here because I picked Houston to lose in the championship game to Auburn. So look. What the hell do I know? No, that, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, what do I know? You didn't uh, have them playing someone else besides Auburn. No, I had them losing to Auburn in the final, and I've been called by certain Houston fans and one Baylor fan that I'm a Houston hater because of that. I picked them to go to the finals and lose to Auburn just because I thought Auburn had some juice. I was wrong. So here's the thing. Now I hope Houston goes to the finals and wins because at least that would make – my prediction, my bracket, worth somewhat of a crap. No, you're done. You were done. Uh, no, I'm done. Look, my you were bracket. Done. I still have some left, but I don't think I'm. Look, I'm yeah, solid. But by, by the way, what? so mine is. But yeah, yeah. Now, Garrett, go jump off a cliff. Uh, <laughs> no, nobody wants to hear it. Uh, <laughs> I haven't even looked at mine yeah. because I. So yeah. Next year, we decided, Smokey, and this is going to be a staff wide thing. We're in honor of Mike Leach, who. Uh, when they asked him the famous question about who would win in a battle between oh, the yeah. mascots, yep. we are going to pick the entire tournament based on mascots. On who could kill who? On who could, like, that's, the, so we're going to do a bracket. Like the Huskies against uh, the Lions or something like yeah, that. Yeah, well, like right now it's the Huskies against the Aztecs. So yeah. you're talking about how many Huskies versus how many Aztecs, right? Like, do the, are the Huskies rabid Huskies? Like, do they have some, some sort of advantage? The Aztecs obviously have, you know, weapons and tools uh, they can use. And they've got, the, they got, they got some Mojo Jojo, don't they? they yeah, yeah. Little, yeah. I mean, like, you know, mystical powers, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. yeah. So. How about the Cyclones against the fighting the lion eye wouldn't the cyclone wipe out I would humans? think a cyclone I would think so. cyclone's gonna win uh the Illini would have I mean as a people that are just out there would have trouble going up against a cyclone but again if there's some sort of you know magic that they could no they could pull no. off I mean, uh, the Cougars against the uh the uh, blue devils see animals are gonna win that yeah but what is a blue devil like does it like I mean it has a pitchfork so that's a thing but you know, well, I would think what Cougars would happen is the cougar would attack the blue devil, mm -hmm. but another blue devil would trip the cougar. <laughs> that seems yeah. fitting. Yes. Wolf pack against the warriors. That might have happened in real life back in the day. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, the Boilermakers. Isn't that a beer? Um, I think, it's I a think train, it's a guy, like it? I think that's a not, like Boilermaker is a a uh, a shot dropped in a beer. What is a zag? What's I have Gonzaga? No clue. I know it's a bulldog, but I don't yeah. know what the zag is. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're bulldogs. So. Yeah, okay. Creighton. Blue Jays. See, look, this Against is the what volunteers. got me got me thinking last week. Blue because, Jays, you love birds. Because, well, no, they played – yes, I don't. Uh, but they played the Ducks, so it was bird versus bird. Oh, yeah. And here's what I thought. Like, the Ducks can go in the water, but really that's only going to give the, the Blue Jays an opportunity to, like, swoop Dive down bomb and peck them. them. Yeah, yeah. But Ducks go in a flock. I just wish one time – Blue Jays are always kind of alone. I would love all of a sudden for a – band of birds to come fly into the studio and you want to see something that would go viral watch this guy um, just no chance it would be the greatest um i'm fine like i've gotten fine with non -planned, like, one bird unplanned planned like i can shoo away one bird that doesn't freak me out unless that's in the room and then i'm like it's coming for me um my wife is worse than i am about birds worse and i know that that's hard to believe like she'll Only jump because behind. they might drop a turd on no, the floor. And she'll, she's also she'll jump behind me in a parking lot and have me walk through them. Well, that's your as, job. As yeah, buddy. I know, yeah, it is. But when we have, um, if you've ever been in Waco in the fall 
in about October, November, these gigantic grackles come in. They're the, not gigantic. They're gigantic. It's the birds. It is Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, and there they're everywhere. Zone. And they you will, go to they H-E-B, will ruin every car on the H-E-B the parking lot. The hardest I've ever seen Smokey laugh <laughs> is one day when we were at the radio station, I looked out, and they were all over our parking lot, all over the car, like the end of The Birds, and I just stood there in the breezeway. And I just walked straight to walked my straight, car. I was like, what are you doing? And he just laughed the whole way there, and I walked like gingerly out to the car. I slowly opened the door. I um, wish one would have gotten in your car. That oh, been, I know. That was what I was afraid uh, of. Yeah, J.G. Neolardo, Smokey is on another level of hype today. Dude takes his vitamins and Wheaties. I haven't had breakfast uh, as far as uh, any kind of cereal in a long, long time, but I would rather be a uh, uh, Lucky Charms. That was always my favorite. Uh, but I, I do a, a supplement, a fish oil pill, baby aspirin, and also... In off-brand Prilosec. But thank you. And I worked out this morning, even though I brought this up. I want to see if the chat room has a doctor. I brought this up. I've told you guys this. I want to bring it up and then the Dak Prescott. Um, I have something going on with a nerve in my body, or maybe a nerve was pinched or whatever, where I don't have any rashes, any irritation. Uh, no, no blisters, no welts, no, no red, nothing. On my skin, but it feels like I have a sunburn. Like right now, my stomach feels like I laid out in the sun on the beach for far too long. And I have been trying, and some others have been trying to figure out what it is, and nobody knows. And it flares up to the point, and it it there's no rash. And nobody in this, nobody at 365 Sports has tried to help me get through this. I am to the point where I might just start doing some heavy drugs just so I don't have to feel it. No doctor's help. None. Well, I hope the weirdest I hope thing. You, I no, hope you, no. I hope oh. you can crowdsource one. No itching. Nothing. No hives. But it's like I have a sunburn in my lower back, my upper shoulders, also on my chest and my stomach. I, it, Kim Coulter apologized to Great Kialani. Well, oh, that was one of those flare-ups, huh? And John Fanta was outstanding. Kim, thank you for the super chat. You're exactly no retired stockbroker. No, it's not shingles, because when I first started having these, um, I remember I was actually talking to Dr. Petty, and he said, you got to be careful about shingles. I've had a shingle shot. By the way, that is one of the most painful shots on earth, other than maybe if you had rabies, and it's not rabies. That is like a jackhammer being put into your shoulder. It is a monster. Are you sure it's not rabies? I haven't slept with bats in a long time. Okay. No, it's not. I mean, you get in a fight with a raccoon? I, don't know. I would be like, I would have like foam coming out of my mouth. Mm. So it's not, it's not shingles. There is no interior, there's no interior pain. There is zero sign. And I know that sometimes the signs of shingles, a sign of shingles can come later on your body, like it's a, like a welt or a blister. Nothing. It's been like four or five or six weeks. So whoever, could it be eczema? Eczema, excuse me. Um, well, I mean, that's the way it's spelled. Eczema. 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 That's a hard word to say. Damn it. Justin, uh, there's no rash. There are no, there's no irritation other than what I feel on my skin. It's the, uh, are you allergic to your laundry? Det Roger, I'm using the same laundry detergent that I've used now for a long, long time, which is uh, uh, whatever H-E-B. It's like Hawaiian tropical, whatever it might. Let's see. Um, now I, it, it's the worst it's, it's, but it's not, it's, it's okay. All right, Paul, tell us about tetanus or typhoid shots are like honey and effing hurt like hell. No, those, those are tough too. Yeah. No, Dak Prescott. I love what the Cowboys are doing. I think this is yeah. something they should have done many times with <laughs> other players in the last 10 or 20 years. And I'm not even a Cowboys fan <laughs> at all. Look. They are apparently, uh, according to Ian Rappaport, uh, Jerry Jones says, uh, we are where we are, locked and loaded for this year and are not going to do any work. And they have an understanding with Dak about his contract for next year, uh, which they better not let him get to the open market because then he's going to be gone. Um, and, and I guess we'll see what happens. Do they uh, have any control over him at all anymore with a franchise tag? No. 
Okay. They can't do that. Right. And then plus they can't like that would be even even if they did, that would be even dumber because yeah, then the, the top cap 5% would be yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. So they're already in cap jail. And look, they're gonna have dead money on the cap if Zach leaves anyway, even though his contract expires, because his contract expires because they have those voidable years, which are dummy years on the back of a contract. So made to help out with the cap, although right now they're not doing anything with it. So if you were holding out hope that the Cowboys were going to make some kind of big move, um, if you were still on that, on that, you know, that level of, oh man, they're going to do something, they'll figure something out. They're not, they're going to go ahead and piece together with, um, veteran minimum deals on free agents and what they have in the draft, which is, uh, three picks in the first 100 and then not another one until 174. Uh, it is going to be interesting, but, uh, I do not expect the Cowboys to be contending um, much more than they were last year. And this is maybe the start of a, they re-sign Parsons and Lamb and see what they can do about the other guys and let Dak walk and roll the dice. Uh, and this is also interesting in that yesterday, Deion Sanders said that he was going to uh, kind of Eli Manning the situations with Travis Hunter and his son Shadur next year, and that he doesn't want them to play anywhere cold. And particularly for Shiloh, there's certain teams he would let him go to. And what was one of those? Dallas. Of course it was, because they're in, involved in everything. But I, it's just weird that that happens the day after, and I don't think one has anything to do with the other. But it's going to be talked about, and it's just – Maybe this is Jerry admitting that, you know, the Cowboys are finally not trying to win the Super Bowl. They're just trying to figure out how to build the roster into the future. Well, they've always wanted to win it, but they also have always wanted to be good enough to be good enough and not go through like they did with Dave and Campbell, they those still five might be, and 11s. And they still might be a good team this year, but I doubt that they can be a great team without having supplemented the roster. Or this is the biggest spoonful of we like our guys ever because it means that – TJ Bass is probably starting the offensive line. And if that works out, they hit another undrafted free agent. It means that, you know, really no significant upgrades are coming to any position on the defense um, that, that they've lost. And that all this is going to be built through the draft and low cost free agents to try to get out of the cap hell that they're going to be in this year and cap hell that they're also going to be in next year. I think it's a good move. Uh, one of the things that they have always done, and they've allowed, you know, what, DeMarcus Ware, DeMarco Murray, and others, they've allowed some of the stars to walk. And it's been good for the stars that walk. Some of them have, like, DeMarcus Ware won a Super Bowl in Denver because he didn't win one in Dallas. And I, 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 you know what the worst part about this is, just the fact that you brought up Dak, is that tomorrow when I'm on the treadmill or I'm on a Stairmaster, I'm going to look off to the left. There's like six or eight television flat screens in, uh, up, on a, uh, up on above the windows that go out towards the tennis courts. And guess what? On the left screen today, Dallas dysfunction, Cowboys disappointment, mm -hmm. all in question mark. Do Jerry and Dak get along? It's just going to be – it's already ad nauseum for a team – that was a disappointment, and they will run something on them. Because it's, it's it's marketing. They're not smart. They're, they're smart. The branding of the star. People will turn in, uh, tune in. I, I I like what they're doing. Uh, there's some Cowboys fans, a few. that Some don't like the NFL at all, but there's some Cowboys fans in the chat. Tell us what you think about the Cowboys letting Dak run his course in a contract. That doesn't mean he'll leave. No, it doesn't. But it's, it's every one of these skin conditions. I've gone to WebMD, by the way. There is some you sort of a do not have leprosy. There, no, uh, I don't have carbuncles. See, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of some sign on your skin about what you would have here. It's driving me nuts. Like, see, look at that. There's a big rash, there's welts, shingles, whatever. Nobody cares about me but me. <laughs> I, we care. It's just Skin it's, problems we're and having treatments. A, we're having a hard time keeping track of all your 64, near 65-year-old stuff. 
You God. need to put up a list. Can hey. we get a whiteboard over here I, where once something goes away, you can take it off or you can like make check like a draft of, board? Yeah. Like, a, like a, yeah. Uh, uh, like, I got rid of my leprosy. I today was on the phone with Medicare and had my Medicare lock, locked in for May 1st. I'm 65 on May 2nd. And then also whatever they call it, like Medicare, A and whatever's May A and B. I never realized that I was that old. Until all of a sudden I started getting mail about what a, a, a year out. Garrett, you don't have to worry about it. Paul, you're getting yeah. close. Um, Garrett is four years younger than me. Uh, the Social Security thing. You know what? If they never would have sent me a piece of mail, I would have never taken that money. I would never have been able to know that I was just because I don't keep up with things like that. And they're trying to take rid of it anyway. But honestly, if I had not gotten mail... I would have gone, like, poof. And I never, I, cause, like, oh, that's like a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. And every dollar that I get back is the dollar I put in, right? Should be. Is it 100% what you put in you get back I, or close I, to it? I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not ever expecting to get it. So. To 65. No. To, like, by the time I'm 65, I expect it to be gone because it, for years they've been Hey, wrecking it. So. Stop for a second. Leave that picture up. Are you sitting in your chair? Yeah. You look like you're down a little bit. Yeah, I know. This look, we have old chairs. Like I'm not that tall. And I know you're not tall See, at all. See, look, I'm higher now. Yeah, there you go. I was but it just, uh, like I was trying to make sure I wasn't with my son. Or like Craig's taller than both of us. He's six six one. Yeah. And no, I was a little bit worried about you there for a second. No, I was yeah, this it, it just I don't know. We need we did we do need new chairs, but I think that would come with like some sort of studio redesign, which we're probably not ready for yet. All right, retired stockbroker, take the money before it's gone. That's what I've been told because who knows when all of a sudden somebody makes a decision and they steal That's, they steal Social Security from look, us. I know that like if you win the lottery, they're supposed you're like the best thing is to take the annuity and like get paid every year. Except I don't trust that the lottery money, especially if it's like a billion dollars, like it is right now. I wouldn't trust that the government wouldn't find a way to spend my money before it got to me. So I'll just take it right now and then probably not tell anybody that I have it. Yeah. But I, you can wait until you're like 66 years old in 10 months, and then you, like my number each month would increase because another year and a half, would, I would not be taking the money. But it's not a bad little deal. I, I, I didn't even know it existed, but I've been paying it the whole time. You don't think about that. When you're, when you're younger and you're like, no. I got a letter in the mail that said, this is a sports show, by the way. I got a letter in the mail that showed me how much I made like in 1979. And that was obviously very humbling. Very, very humbling. Uh, here's from John. David, does your face flush when that happens? No. No, I don't think so. But thanks for asking. Uh, Kim Coulter, I'm on my way back to the allergist tomorrow. I don't like this topic. Okay, we'll, we'll stop it right now. <laughs> Uh, what the F has Dak ever won? Nothing. Again, nothing. But, like, it's not just him. You know, he's not... He's never been the biggest of their problems. He's just the most obvious symptom. Um, so, it, it, you know, he, he just had an MVP-type year, but he is part of that debacle that they had at home against Green Bay. So, he hasn't won anything. Like, again, I'm not... I'm not attached if I'm Cowboys fans to Dak as much, and I'm a Cowboys fan. But like, does I, I don't, letting him walk though bring any fear at all? Because they've been they've been fortunate they've been, with they, Romo and Dak, and they didn't take advantage of it enough to win a championship. Yeah, look, they by went having guys the, that were one undrafted, yeah. and secondly, a fourth round pick. Yeah, they they've won with that, and they they probably I think the next phase they need to go get a plus quarterback in a high round. Uh, because they haven't won Super Bowls since the guy was a first, the first overall pick in Troy Aikman. So, I don't know. You can win in a lot of different ways. They haven't figured it out. Um, I don't know. And they're about to waste Dak's window like they wasted Tony Romo's. And as much as Tony Romo was responsible for a lot of the Cowboys' issues when it came to winning the playoffs, he was never the worst problem. And if the quarterback is not really the biggest problem, if you don't – they never – their whole thing has been with the quarterback is go do something when – you know, Aikman and, look, if Troy Aikman was playing now, like, he would have all kind of 
passing records. It'd be ridiculous. He was such an accurate passer with a laser rocket arm. But the Cowboys of the 90s didn't really have to rely on Aikman to come back and win games like they do with – because the game's different now – like they do with with what they do with Tony and Dak. So I, I think it's um, – they just haven't figured out those things. And yeah, I don't get too attached. And if they need to go through a rebuild, they go through a rebuild. Go ahead and do it. They haven't really done it in a while. They got lucky because they had a bad year because Romo got hurt. They drafted Zeke Elliott fourth, and he was a stud for them for, for a few years. And then they also drafted Dak in that draft, and he's been good for them. Otherwise, they're about probably back in the quarterback desert like they were post Aikman when it was Quincy Carter and Vinny Testaverde and Drew Bledsoe and Drew Henson and uh, uh, another uh, Chad Hutchinson and Anthony Wright and yeah, it was Clint it was, Sterner. Yep, yeah, it went. It went through. They went through a, a long stretch. Five o'clock hour. Tony Banks didn't even make the team. Hey, at five, you're right. At, uh, at five fifteen, Sam Con the Athletic dot com is going to join us, and so we'll start the segment with him at five fifteen when he can join us. But reality. The Big 12, anybody that was a part of the Big 12 when it was formed in 1996 until through this last year, Oklahoma won a national title in 2000. Texas won it in 2005. Oh, by the way, did anyone see that sucker punch on Vince Young? Ooh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know what it is, but I know we're an angry society now. Everybody seems to be frustrated about whatever. But, man, I see more sucker punches and five-on-one type fights. It's unbelievable. But. Nebraska in 97. That's it. Kansas State had their chance in 98, couldn't finish. Kansas State, I th what was the year that they, uh, was it uh, that but Baylor held them at the goal line and eventually hammered uh, them? 13, they were 13 right? or so. Yeah. Oklahoma State's been on the verge. TCU and Baylor in 14, but they, so they have three teams. Nebraska in 97, Texas in 2000, and Texas in 2005. Over a 10-year period of time, a little bit less than that, they won three national titles. They've been in the playoffs. But now that Texas and Oklahoma are leaving in the SEC, and Nebraska's been gone for over a decade or so, almost 14 years, who is the most likely team in the Big 12 in football that can win a national title? Like, legitimately can win a national title. And especially now, you could run the table and win a bowl game and you could win the national title. Now you could run the table and might have to play three or four games. Do they have anybody that legitimately can win a national title and take on that, that, that run in the postseason with the college football playoff expansion? Who would that be? Think about it. And we'll discuss it with Sam Kahn, but also now with you coming up in the next segment. This is 365 Sports. Looking to connect with Baylor alums in your area? Baylor alumni can help. Looking to host a watch party in your city? Baylor alumni can get you started. Want to step out in your community and serve with other alums? Baylor alumni is your connection with the university and each other. Let's get started. Learn how at baylor.edu slash alumni. Thank you for calling your local Marco's Pizza. We're turning up the heat with our new Reaper Cheesy Bread. Fresh house-made dough is topped with a spicy cheese blend infused with jalapeno, habanero, and Carolina Reaper peppers. At only $5.99, this limited-time product is a hot deal. Add it to your order while you can. A Marco's team member will be with you shortly. Marco's Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. And that offer on the Reaper Cheesy Bread is available right now at any of the five Marco's Pizza locations in Waco, including Bell Mead, China Spring, Robinson, in Woodway and Hewitt. Order online at Marcos.com. Call for a pickup or delivery. Marcos Pizza is turning up the heat with their all-new Reaper Cheesy Bread with fresh, hot, house-made dough topped with a spicy cheese blend infused with jalapeno, habanero, and Carolina Reaper peppers and only $5.99 and for a limited time only. Marcos Pizza, the fastest-growing pizza brand in America, five locations in Waco, and the new Reaper Cheesy Bread. Marcos Pizza. Pizza lovers get it. <laughs> 
With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Niche Group Insurance Agency. With the Niche Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Niche Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Niche Group at 1-800-258-8302. Did you know that one out of every four men have symptomatic low levels of testosterone and don't even know it? And if you think you're too young to worry about it, guess again. Low T levels can make you feel tired and grumpy, raise your cholesterol, and cause weight gain. Petty Clinic Low T can set up same-day blood screening and results. So if you're tired of being tired, call or go online at PettyClinicLowT.com. It's a private clinic with an atmosphere catering to men. Affordable, only $165 a month, including lab work, office consultation, testosterone injections, and follow-up visits compared to $300 or more a month in Dallas or Austin, and you don't have to drive 90 miles one way or the other and fight the traffic. Petty Clinic Low T has board-certified physician consultations and will provide the best form of brand-strength testosterone. Contact Petty Clinic Low T for increased energy, improvement in sexual desire and performance, mood, concentration, even a decrease in body and belly fat. Just off Highway 84 and Old Hewitt Drive in Woodway, PettyClinicLowT.com. This is 365 Sports. Text us at 254-339-1122. The text line is sponsored by Riverbend Liquor and Wine with the most extensive variety of craft beer in Waco. A hidden gem on Lakeshore Drive and 19th Street. All right, here we go. This uh, 5 o'clock hour, Sam Conn around the corner. Uh, a couple more things. Thoughts about what I'm dealing with. Allergies, maybe? Plants causing redness? Any new landscaping? I haven't really gotten into landscaping. I usually do, but I, I just haven't done that yet. And I'll usually do that by the time we get to the 1st of April. So I asked the question, which of the 12, uh, excuse me, the 16 teams, the Big 12 effective this summer, with Utah, Arizona, Arizona State, and Colorado joining the conference, Texas and OU out. Nebraska's been out. Those are the three in the Big 12 that have won a national title. Which, in your opinion, and, and I don't think it's just, oh, by the way, it's Utah or it's whoever. Why would we say if you pick somebody that they actually can do that and think that they can win not only basically every game but maybe one or two, but then run through what would be what? From six, 12 let's say you get a first round bye. Mm -hmm. Then there's eight teams, so you would have to win what three games to win the national title. Is that right? I believe so. Let me double check. So there's it, only... it might be more than that before we get to if they expand it. So once once they make the new conference, the new sixteen, there's only one team who's won it in the modern era. BYU. And, um, since BYU. Well two teams. BYU and Colorado. Colorado with like 90 or so. Yeah, so with BYU Eric, won in 84. Colorado won it in like 90, 90, yeah, 90. Yeah. And so that's been a long Darian time Hagen. ago. That's been a long time ago for both of them to do it. And then a third team was really close two years ago in TCU. Yep. Um, I mean, they played in the game, yeah, a but game that it, was not really close, no. but they played in the game. Uh, Kansas State's knocked on the door but never gotten in. Like, they've never been where they're playing for the national title. I mean, uh, Baylor, you know, was right on the cusp in the in 2014. 14, maybe 15 but, if but Russell did, stays healthy. But, but didn't, didn't get in, yep. right? And they finished fifth, so, remember, in 21 yeah, yeah. Uh, the, with that the, great team that they had defensively that was so good. The best year that Texas Tech ever had. They were um, waylaid by the fact that they had this triumvirate of losses with everybody beating Texas each other in Texas, and Oklahoma. Texas Tech, yeah. So there's, you know, only one team very recently, and college football is very different than it was in 1984 and 1990, that's been close. And that was TCU. And now this, the game is changing. So this is a really tough question to answer based on the fact that we haven't seen this conference in its current form play each other yet, how it's going to go through. You know that you know most of the teams in the league haven't ever really been close You know to do it like Arizona, Arizona State. Cincinnati Kansas, was since, in the semis. Cincinnati was close. Yeah, they were in the semis. So, But for the most part, outside of, uh, of outlier seasons, 
you know, nobody has them. You know, Houston, I mean, you know, they had some great, se- you know, teams under Jack Pardee uh, and Bill Yeoman back in the day. But bottom line is, is that were they ever close to winning the national title? No. You know, I mean. <sighs> yeah, Kyle, TCU was only like 55 points away. Yeah. And, you know, just like it, they got there, but that was when you had to win twice. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to have to win possibly five, up to five, f- four or five games. It's up to if you if you have a if you don't have the buy, you got to get five. If you have the okay, you go you from eight. Four. You'll be a part of that's a group a of eight, team. so that's one. Correct, because that starts this year. So you play that first one. You go from eight to four, and then you have to play quarterfinals, semifinals, well, and championships. So four wins. You'd have to win four, I think, at twelve. Yeah. So, yeah, that's – got to get four, four wins. There might be on two hands the number of teams that have the ability to handle a four-game, not only do well in the season, come out of it where you're in the playoff, not in any kind of fluky way, and then win four consecutive games against Alphas. And I, 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 I think it's fair to say I don't know who it is. I I don't I know Utah would be uh, a, a pick because of what Coach Willingham has uh, Willingham has done, but uh, I you know and you mentioned some others I don't know if they, if there is one, and that's not saying there's like none, but I don't know who that would I like. That's who you want. You go to the uh, Big Ten, Ohio State, mm-hmm. um, Michigan, Michigan, Oregon, no. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, not until they do it. Washington was as close as they could possibly be. Not until they do it. That's fair. Uh, USC, Penn State, those are schools that you you know you would not like feel completely dirty if you said one of them because, and yet for USC, when's the last time they knocked on the door? Two thousand five. Yeah. All right. The SEC: Georgia, Alabama, uh, LSU, Texas just went to the semis. Yeah. LSU. Uh, I, they, teams like Florida have to get back on track. Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma and Florida. has to kind of maybe kind of show the st- uh, stability. Yeah, there's okay. There's the level of the you know Texas who's right now hot, Bama, Georgia, and LSU who who can't who you know. Listen, LSU, can. it's a bad year when they're nine and three. So nope. they're, they're yeah. used. That, that's and a then, standard. For and them. then there's the level of. You know, Florida, Auburn, Tennessee, Miss, Ole Miss, Oklahoma. Ole, yeah. Oklahoma. No, Ole Miss, Ole Miss and AM are in another level of you got to prove you can do it first because they never have. You know, they're in the same level to me. Oregon's higher up than them because they've come closer. But Oregon, I mean, they're a cool program. They get a lot of hype, but they've never won it. They've never won it. So, um, yeah, that like Oregon, you gotta to me, you, you've got to put them just on the fringe. Now they're they're knocking to the door, but until they they kick it down, no. Who, is Florida State who beat them? No, they lost a uh, Florida State lost to them. Auburn? No, Ohio State beat them. Was it also Ohio State? Ohio State beat them. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if it was the Cam Newton team. Uh, and then Cam Newton might have beaten them too, but I'm just saying, like recently, the most recent one was they they lost in the first CFP championship to Ohio State. Okay. Yeah, they played in 2011, Oregon and Auburn in the national championship. Yeah, so yeah. they've lost Cam twice. Newton. They lost to Cam, they lost to Cam Newton and lost to Zeke. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 that Ohio State Zeke team was Zeke tore him up. All right, so <laughs> was that the Zeke Elliott team with Cardo Jones? Yeah, as yeah. a quarterback who was the third string mm-hmm. quarter. So, really, we, I think we could safely say there's about ten or twelve that we would feel okay with saying they'll win a national title in the next three to five years. Yeah. I think I think Clemson could win four games. There will be someone that comes know. out of not the blue, but will come out of like you know and and become really good in, in, in any of the conferences. Unfortunately, with Washington State, Oregon State, and anyone in the Mountain West or whatever, they're going to have to or, uh, you know they're going to have to just have but, a hellacious, just an hellacious year, and then also on top of that, win again, not making the playoffs. But winning four games in some cases. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Good God, that's a battery. Ram. It's interesting to me how this came about in the in the in the playoff. In that you have uh, you know playoff expansion is supposed to make it more equal for everybody. In that a team like Alabama can't run away and hide because they only have to win two playoff games every year, right? They can't they can't be as much of a dynasty as they were. But 
simultaneously by agreeing to expand the playoff, the SEC and Big Ten found a way to where, yeah, we can probably keep that where we run away and hide because we're not going to share all the money and we're going to make this, you know, graduated income sharing, uh, which is ask the Big 12 Conference how that worked out for them mm -hmm. and why they're in the spot that they're in right now. Yep. Because the reason that they almost broke up the first time was because – Teams were tired of Texas getting the most money and telling them what to do uh, and running the conference, so they left. And so eventually, you know, people get tired of that and say, hey, what about ours? And you create this division. So the SEC and Big Ten have kind of headed off like any kind of mystery at the past going, you know, this is how it's going to be. And, you know, I don't know. Like, again, the 12-team playoff and the what what's eventually going to be the 14- or 16-team playoff, we'll see how it goes. But, you know, for me to be able to pick – uh, any of the Big 12 teams to be in that group of teams that can win it right now, I have no idea. And that's a that's, right and, now it sounds like a bad thing, but it might actually be a good thing in that this is a whole new league and we're going to find out how it's going to That's why I don't even want to fill out my media poll this year. And I know Kim's a huge, Katie Rader, a, a, a huge tech fans, I get it. But they haven't won a conference title outright, and I don't remember. And so I go, I know what they're doing with the back to back 20, top 25 recruiting classes, some of the players that they're gathering. And that means that they can compete perhaps for the Big 12 title, but then still not lose two or three games during the season, an on conference game, and then actually then win four consecutive playoff games. I'm not so sure anyone can do that. Somebody will because eventually you, you got the bracket. And so uh, we'll have Sam Kahn. He had a, uh, I guess you could go back and forth with David Ubbett on this. And I think it's fair to be honest about it. I can't tell you who it would be. Now, maybe somebody comes out of this and they do get stronger because they get the even more and better and a, a once-in-a-lifetime quarterback because that's what you need too. How many teams that have won the national title well, Alabama had two or three. I'm talking about once-in-a-lifetime quarterbacks, Cam Newton, uh, Joe Burrow. Yep. Those t Tommy Frazier, Charlie Ward, Jameis Winston. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm missing some. I'm not trying to do that on purpose. Georgia's won. Have they had once-in-a-lifetime quarterbacks? No. Although uh, theirs is coming back for another year. But no, but like, look, they won – those two with a rascally dude. When named OU won it in 2000, it was Josh Heupel, a yeah. Juco guy. Yeah. Vince so, Young. Vince Young. Sometimes it's about the alpha like Vince Young, and sometimes it's about the fact that you have a great leader who's a good college quarterback surrounded by alphas. You know? Uh, look, Florida State in 96, the quarterback was Danny Cannell. Right? I mean, so, with Thad Busby. But it was Danny Cannell. Like, so it was those guys, you know, um, and Oklahoma, you know, won, a, won with Hypo. Alabama's first few were with guys like, uh, uh, Bear, uh, what's his name? Uh, he had the hot wife. McElroy? Uh, McElroy. Not, I mean, he might, I don't know, but I'm talking about the. Um, the hot wife. His the girlfriend they kept showing. Brody Croyle? Bro, uh, yeah, Brody Croy was in there. Was he a Jacob yeah. Coker? Jacob, not Jacob Coker, A.J. McCarron. Oh, A.J. McCarron, like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know. All right, uh, when we come back, we'll have uh, Sam Kahn on this to yeah. see what he and David Ubbett so, came up with. Um, Katie Rader says, we are coming and we have money and we have good leadership and AAU is a, a, about there. Okay, here's the thing. Tech has money. Other schools have money, but the TV networks are about to give them more money so – even though these schools, like technically LSU will have less money to raise to do these things, right? Yep. So tech and the Big 12 schools and the ACC schools, they can have people with all the money in the world, but they're still not getting money on the front end as the other ones are, so they have to raise more money. So you can have more money, but if you have to raise more than everybody else, it is a little bit harder. Uh, okay, Katie Rader, I know you go. We have good leadership and AAU is about there. What does that have to do with winning a national championship in football? Uh, I, mean, I guess someone, it would mean more money for your school and your oh, coffers. Yeah, okay, but okay. Um, but the bottom line is, is that like if you have to raise more money from the fr on the front end, like 
these television networks are just giving the Big Ten 30 million more dollars than the Big 12 has right now. 40 million more. So they don't have to raise every, every year. year. So, so 30 th- to 60 to what is 100, you know, yeah. So when you say we have money with pockets, you know, like, yeah, you do. But the thing is, is so do they. And they also are starting out ahead of you. Yeah. And, and, and oh, again, by the way, uh, we hope as someone that covers the Big 12, whoever it might be, I don't even care who it is, that somebody becomes an alpha uh, and do and can do it consistently. But, man, you put that in front of you, you have to go – during the regular season, you're going to have to go probably minimum of what, 10-2? 10-2, 9-3, yeah. Mm-hmm. That include the conference championship game? I didn't even bring yeah, that up. It should. So you play 13 games if you play in the conference championship game. So now you're talking about going 11-2 and two or 12-1. and one. Yeah, you can win a conference title 8-5 and because you just kind of hit the, the jackpot one game. But – um, then you have to win four playoff games. Uh, Katie Rader, I'm not arguing that Paul's question was about, the, but it's about the Big 12. Just saying we are plenty happy. Oh, look. Oh, no. The Big Katie 12, Rader, they they'll got, be they're, fine. They're getting better and yeah. better, and they do seem to have everything aligned at, at, in Lubbock. But yet again, it's a program that is going decades upon decades upon decades, even with what Joey's brought to the table and the NIL, without winning a conference championship. Uh, not a partial, but at least a conference championship. So God bless Joey if he can do that. That would be incredible. All right, when we come back, Sam Kahn, this is 365 Sports. Our good friend Brad Boozer, Boozer's Jewelers here at 365 Sports. Now, Brad, uh, people who watch uh, and listen to our show know I'm a double-time customer for you, engagement ring and wedding band, and you guys do that great, but that's not all you do at Boozer's Jewelers. Absolutely. And uh, I always like to say, you know, it's a new year. It's a great way to start the year out. Uh, Go through your old jewelry, go through your wife's jewelry box, go through anything you're maybe not wearing, something that's broken, something that you're not using. We do a a massive amount of custom work. We can take your old jewelry, old diamonds, old watches, and we can convert it into something special for you and make a -a one-of-a-kind piece of jewelry. Uh, And if that's not something you're interested in, uh, a great thing is we can turn that into cash. So we buy gold, we buy diamonds, we'll buy Rolex watches, any kind of heirloom jewelry, anything that's maybe passed down to you. Boozer's Jewelers, where do they find you, Brad? We're at 1025 North Valley Mills Drive, right on the corner of Lake Air Drive and Valley Mills with the big clock on the corner. Pioneer Steel and Pipe opened their doors in 1943 and they have never wavered with their focus on great product and customer service, relationships with a handshake, making sure you, the customer, is satisfied. Their new facility is now twice the size, allowing new inventory, higher quantities, and in a much more organized fashion. In addition to the long lengths in tubing, angles, channels, rods, and flat, Pioneer Steel and Pipe now offers several shorter, more convenient lengths of material already cut. Their 2,500 square foot showroom has over a thousand new products in stock, new welding supplies, hardware, quick creep, and do-it-yourself components for any project, whether you are a professional contractor or weekend warrior. The new facility is designed to make your loading experience faster and more efficient with easy drive lanes around the building and much more room to get your trailer loaded. Our location may have changed, but our values haven't, and our relationship with customers goes much farther than just business. Pioneer Steel and Pipe on Loop 340 and Highway 6 and just east of I-35 in Waco. Alan Samuels House of Travel is a full-service travel agency with highly experienced travel consultants plus support staff with over a combined 150 years in the travel business. They are ready to take care of any travel situation for you, your family, and your business. And with the kind of knowledge to complete a seamless itinerary trip start to finish. They will search for the best deal to accommodate your budget from air to cars, ship to shore, hotel, and even meeting space. Name a destination and they've been there. They know the places to go in international and mission travel is one of their unique specialties. Alan Samuels, House of Travel, celebrating 50 years in business. Call Connie, Sherry, Linda, or Bambi at 254-776-2560 or find them on Facebook or at houseoftravelwaco.com. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. Enjoying the show? Hit the like button and subscribe. Sam Kahn, the Athletic.com. I was kind of just looking around a little bit about some of 
those who we have have guessed, and, and also just some college football notes and Sam and David Ubbin with a uh, discussion about the Big 12 and a national championship type contender now that Nebraska's been gone forever, Texas and OU on their way out the door. Sam, is it is is it a shot at the conference or is it, it, it that you really can't think of anybody in not you, but I can't think of somebody that would say that's it. That's that's who can compete and win a national title, not just be good, but win four, maybe three or four consecutive playoff games. What does that say? Well, I think for one, it's it's an acknowledgement that this is a conference that is not going to bring in elite talent on a year-to-year basis. And when I say elite talent, I mean top 100 recruits, five-star recruits at a high volume. And that's what the teams that have won national championships have in common is almost all of them in this modern era have recruited at a top 10 maybe top 15 level with a, with a couple of exceptions. I think Michigan was a little bit of an exception. They really haven't had, I guess, like an old elite top five class. Clemson has had some top 10 classes, but of course had a generation, generational quarterbacks with Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence. But the teams in the Big 12 in the new 16-team format are all teams that largely recruit in the 30s and the 40s, the 50s, and even the 60s nationally. So – That is just not a talent level commensurate with what we know to win a national championship. Now, does that change now in the portal era? Because your teams are not all high school recruits. They're recruits plus portal guys. And did TCU maybe show us that formula two years ago because they were one of those teams outside of that recruiting uh, stratosphere? Maybe they are a blueprint for what can be done. But, yeah, I I think it's one is that none of those teams recruited that level. But I think the other thing it tells us, is that, and you've mentioned this before, Dave, is the, from 1 to 16, it's a, there's a lot of parity in this league, and there's no real dominant team that you look at and say, oh, that's going to be the big dog in this conference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sam, we're probably going to have to see five, six years of this league to see who can really separate, you know, which coaches stay. How long is Deion Sanders at Colorado? Like, those, like when he stops having kids that are playing quarterback there, you know, is it, is it different? You know, what changes about the Big 12 all over the place? You know, who gets hired other places? How much further does the separation get between the Super 2 and them? Like, there's really – this is the, one of the more difficult things to forecast. Yeah, and, and that's why when you look at it, when, when David and I and, and Mitch Light, our recruiting, national recruiting editor, uh, we had this discussion on our Until Saturday podcast this week. Uh, the, 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 we, it was an interesting exercise to try to decipher, and we tried to break the, the, the league into tiers. And when we thought about the top tier of teams that we think, okay, if you're picking a team out of the Big 12, the 16 team Big 12, to be a contender, what are you looking for? And me personally, I'm looking for teams that have shown a history of success, more recent history, and that have some really – stable coaching situations because I feel like coaching matters so much in this. And to your point, you mentioned Dion, like we don't know how long he's going to be there. You feel like Lance Leipold's going to be in Kansas now for a while. He passed up a lot of jobs and just signed that seven year deal. Maybe he's there for a while. But when I looked at the top tier, I thought of Utah because Kyle Whittingham has, has been there for a long time and he's what he's won 67% of his games in 21 seasons. I think of Oklahoma state, because Mike Gundy is entering his 20th season there and has won 67% of his game. And Oklahoma State has been more weeks in the AP Top 25 than any other Big 12 program since 2000 uh, of the new Big 12. I think of Kansas State uh, with Chris Kleiman, and, and they're coming off a, a Big 12 championship a couple years ago. They have generated some consistency. And, of course, you have to think about TCU as well because they played for a national championship recently, although – their trajectory is not as consistent. They've got a national championship appearance sandwich between two, five, and seven seasons. So it makes you wonder a little bit, and you wonder how big a season is this for TCU. But if they are able to bounce back, you, I think you generally like all the ingredients that exist at TCU from recruiting footprint, location, coaching staff, all that stuff that all adds up to something that you would expect would be a winning program. So of the group of, let's say, uh, of the conferences, Big Ten, SEC, ACC, Big 12, even the group of five, and we include Washington State, Oregon State, of course, as we should, but if, in fact, they were to ever move into that 32 to 50 or 40 game 
or a, a conference super two as Craig trademarked or should have uh, several weeks ago or months ago. Does that eliminate even some that we think would compete for a national title or would that be about the same teams? Yeah, if, if, if we move into a super league for better or worse, it, and it, I guess it depends on how many teams are involved. Because uh, the, one, the one thing I want to know is if, you, if we end up in that place, does all the SEC and Big Ten, are they all a part of it? And when I say all of the SEC and Big Ten, I mean, does that mean Vanderbilt's part of it? Mm-hmm. Does that mean Illinois is part of it? Because if so, why does it make sense for the lower half Big Ten and SEC teams to be in something like that over a team like TCU or a team even like Baylor? The, the programs that have won conference championships and have achieved something more recently. Than, than some of those programs have. That's the question. And and I think the Big 12 schools and the conference as a whole obviously is going to try to do everything it can to position itself to be part of whatever future that is. I think it's very clear that these are programs with a lot of, of, of administrations that want to be a part of whatever that future is. And that's why you see Texas Tech, for instance, investing a lot in NIL infrastructure. You see Oklahoma State you know, investing a lot in infrastructure. You see uh, some of these other programs in this conference getting aggressive with those things. I think they want to be a part of that. And the question is, is who decides who's part of it and and what's the cutoff? How many teams are we talking 32? Are we talking 48? You know, well, what is the cutoff and how is it set up and who's running it? Sam, um, when you look at the teams with the most potential long-term, if you just took it on the surface, would you start with some of the newer teams like Utah, who's, who's made deeper runs, or are there um, dyed-in-the-wool Big 12 teams that, that really are sleeping giants? Yeah, I think Utah, to me, when I look at short-term, I think Utah, because they're a team that has won, what, two Pac-12 championships in three years. Again, stable coaching situation. They've shown an ability to recruit and develop and retain. And those are all, I think, really translatable traits to bring over from the Pac-12 to the, to the Big 12. I think – and now you think of Utah as a team that recruits the state of Texas, even when they were in the Pac-12. Well, now they're in a, in a, in a conference with four Texas teams. And so now it makes it even easier for them to want to recruit that state and, and maybe recruit that state even more. Uh, Kansas State, Oklahoma State, TCU, again, all short-term. When I think of long-term potential, I still think, and this is a big year, I still think Baylor is part of that conversation in my mind because three conference championships in the last 11 years played for another one in, in 2019. Even if the Dave Aranda experiment doesn't end well, I think with the administration that you have from president to AD on down, they have shown an, a, a willingness to invest in, in success and they've won at a high level with three different head coaches in the last dozen years that to me shows that there's a foundation that that, that can be re- repeated so that even if it doesn't work on the Randa, maybe the next coach you get in there does Houston is another team that I think is potentially one of those high ceiling teams because of where they're located because they're right in one of the most fertile recruiting grounds in the country and I think we saw what the peak could be in the Tom Herman era when they went 13-1 and in 2015. They won the Peach Bowl. Then they went and signed a top 35 class that next year, including Ed Oliver, who was a five-star. I think that showed you a peak of what the potential could be. And, and I know some of you guys who have know your Southwest Conference history mm-hmm. would know they won four Southwest Conference titles when they were in it in 20 years. It's not pretty. That's not bad at all. So that the, the biggest thing is they haven't been part of that membership for the last you know, 28 years. So does that help them do that? And then the other one is, I think UCF is one of them that I would identify as one with long-term potential just because they're such a big school. They're located in Florida. They have a really good coach, one at a high level. Uh, so those those are the ones that I would think of off the top of my head. Yeah, and then and there's always that possibility. I brought this up, Sam, and we appreciate you jumping on with us today, is that a, a once-in-a-lifetime talent that you get at quarterback that you can keep that's not like – He's going to play for you, and let's say you're, I don't know who it is, Iowa State, and then you can keep him. That means that two years from then, he's not like playing for Texas, Oklahoma, Georgia, or Ohio State. That might Mm -hmm. also be at least an exception that over 10 years, there may be one or two of those guys too. 
Yeah, no doubt. Arizona is one of those right now. Like they kept Noah Fafita. That's huge for them, especially in this conference where, again, there's no dominant power. That gives them a window right now, with, even with their new coach, Brent Brennan. If they hold on to him at quarterback, when you watch the way he played last year and, and, and the potential he has, they're a team that can be in the mix, I think, here in the short term. Uh, and I think I think for that goes for any program. Any program that has one of those, like you said, big-time program-defining quarterbacks, if you can get one of those in this conference, I think it can rocket you up, up the standings really quickly. Sam, thank you, buddy. Great stuff, great topic, and uh, one that will be fun to kind of watch to see how things might unfold or will unfold in the uh, coming months and years. Sam Kahn, TheAthletic.com with us on 365 Sports. Craig Smokes back with us when we come back. Hall of Fame columnist John McClain. And by the way, thinking about those in the area of Baltimore with that uh, cargo ship uh, that, that rammed into a bridge that was a bad deal earlier today. This is 365 Sports. Marco's Pizza, pizza lovers get it, marcos.com. Online, you could order numerous type of food. The pizzas, of course, different kinds with code words and get discounts. Sandwiches, wings, uh, salads, and you can get drinks if you want those delivered too, or you can pick them up at a location. Five locations in Waco, Bellmead, China Spring, Woodway, Hewitt, and Robinson. Marco's Pizza, Bob Mock, the owner of the five locations in Waco, fastest growing pizza brand in America, and available to you at marcos.com. Pizza lovers get it. It's Dodge Power Shot Days at Allen Samuels in Waco. Experience the adrenaline-pumping performance and cutting-edge technology of Dodge. From the sleek and stylish 2023 Charger to the performance and muscle of a Challenger to the bold and rugged Durango. During Dodge Power Shot Days, we're offering amazing deals and special incentives that will make driving a new Dodge even more exhilarating. Don't miss out on these exclusive savings. Visit Allen Samuels in Waco today and unleash the power of Dodge. Come by. Let's be friends. Developed by Startup Waco, a nonprofit organization, GXG is a program designed to support the entrepreneurial development of Baylor University student athletes through NIL activations. The program helps student athletes maximize their platforms and offers a comprehensive support system for them to create and grow new businesses that not only benefit themselves, but also uplift the local economy. Fans who wish to support student athletes can donate to GXG via the GXG NIL fund baylorbears.com slash gxg contributions to support nil activations through gxg can be made at baylorbears.com slash gxg for more information follow at gxg underscore green x gold on social media and visit the official website www.gxg.startupwaco.com gxg empowering student athlete entrepreneurship and uplifting the local economy through NIL activations. How did Edward Jones become one of the biggest financial service companies in the world? By not acting that way. Financial strategies, one-on-one advice, it's a big difference. And that's why Brad Wilson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, makes sense of investing. Experience the difference for yourself. Brad Wilson, 250 Sharon Drive in Woodway, 254-776-4337. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Are you ready to elevate your Waco experience to a whole new level? Look no further than the Baylor Club, where you can indulge in one-of-a-kind luxury and unwind in our exclusive lounge area. Located in the heart of McLean Stadium, this elite club offers five-star member atmosphere for all your work and play needs. With a master culinary team and outstanding hospitality, we take pampering to a whole new level. Weddings, milestones, businesses, and birthdays. A stadium roaring with bear spirit featuring stunning city skyline views, the Baylor Club truly has it all. The Baylor Club is the destination for Baylor basketball pregame meals, beverages, with this special membership offer. If you mention Sikkim 365 or 365 Sports Radio, just ask for John or Devin for details. For interest in membership or your next private event, call 254-710-8080 or Google Baylor Club Linktree for more information on menus, calendars, upcoming special events. Say yes to the Baylor Club today. 254 254- 710-8080 or Google Baylor Club Linktree. This is 365 Sports, powered by Sikkim365.com. 
The 5 o'clock hour is sponsored by Edward Jones Investments with financial advisor Brad Wilson. Investing his time and experience back to you and your money during today's changing times. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Now here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. John McClain, Hall of Fame columnist with us, all three here on set. Just a little bit, what, a mile away from McLean Stadium and a little less than that away from the Foster Pavilion. John McLean, Hall of Famer, joins us. Uh, John, Paul brought this up earlier today about the Cowboys looking at the decision to possibly let Dak run his course with his contract. I kind of like it. I know that might be suicide. Your thoughts? Well, if they do, they'll have to start over next year. I don't believe that Trey Lance is the answer. We know it's not Cooper Rush. So they'll be in the business of trying to get a quarterback coming off another good season in which they will not be in position to draft one because where they'll be drafting, which is always in the 20, you can't pay enough to move up to get a top prospect. Now, next year's draft is not supposed to be anything like this year's draft. So if you need one, you should do it now. Free agents, you never know. I just, I'll be real surprised if something is not done with Dak's contract that will extend it. Could be next year, could be this year, but uh, he he shows no signs of letting up. As you guys know, the only criticism of him is in the playoffs, and he's not the only one who spit the bit in the playoffs, starting with Mike McCarthy, really, and every other coach since Jimmy Johnson. You don't count Barry Switzer because he won with Jimmy's players, but they are. You talk about walking a tightrope, and you're right there on the verge of falling off when the Cowboys have to start over and go through the growing pains. That can be dangerous. Well, and they've never really had to do that, John. I mean, not since Tony Romo. They they got lucky uh, in that Dak. They got Dak in that draft. They had one bad year, and then the worst they are is mediocre. So. Um, they don't. They don't have the ability to, you know, completely burn it down to the to the rivets and start again. Well, they may say, okay, we got Dak in the fourth round. We got Romo undrafted, but Romo had to sit for three years. And Dak was a great scouting job, a great coaching job of him to help him develop quick. Maybe everything will work out next year. He's not going to the poorhouse anyway. We look at it, but boy, when you roll the dice. Like they are, uh, it is it is very it puts you in a really really difficult predicament when you think about that position. I'm stunned they haven't done it yet and seem to be happy to take a chance on him walking. But I just can't imagine that's going to happen. I do know this: if he plays really well again next year, it'll cost them even more money to keep him. John, uh, some interesting rules changes uh, going on. We've got the uh, new kickoff rules that have been okayed and um, or passed at the league meeting, and also uh, the hip drop tackle. I was trying to think of the name of it. The hip drop tackle being removed uh, as well uh, due to, to injuries. Uh, your thoughts? I, I know the kickoff one in particular is a, a change to how we're going to watch the game. I mean, that's going to be noticeable, whereas the tackles might not be as much so. But uh, your thoughts on both of those changes? I'd never heard the term hip drop till a couple of years ago. Now, I understood when they got rid of the horse collar because you could watch that, and it made you cringe when you thought of the guy being bent back like that. And the hip drop tackle, I feel terrible for defensive players. Every rule that's changed is designed to help the offense because the the NFL knows fans want to see scoring. They don't want to see a pitcher duel. They want to see scoring. They'd rather see a 35-34 than a 10-9, even though the 10-9 might be exciting right up until the end. And uh, it's hard enough. Like, think of a quarterback. They probably should put an X on a quarterback showing where you can hit him because you can't hit him in the head area. Can't hit anybody with your helmet, and they can't hit them below the waist. And a lot of times, think about how hard it must be to tackle a guy to begin with. And when you got to you got to zero in on a certain part of the body, it is difficult. They'll do it. It'll create some controversy. There'll be a lot of calls we think are bad, 
but we'll adjust because it's a great game with great players. And uh, they always seem to roll with the punches. But never forget, it's all about offense. Yeah, you're right. My question about the hip drop tackle, whatever you want to call it, is that it's physics, too. Now, I understand you could probably figure it out just like targeting or, you know, um, using the helmet and all that. But aren't there going to be some plays that's just physics of a big 240-pound linebacker or whatever chasing down somebody and his body is whipped around because of physics and, and they get called for a tackle that's really not trying to be that way? Absolutely, David. And there's guys on the – say in preseason, you're trying to make the team. You know, you're p- trying to make money for your family. And can you afford to think while you're chasing that, go, okay, can I hit him there? Can I hit him Hit him here? What, oops, it's a touchdown, I'm cut. And if you back off, you're cut. It's better to go ahead and make the play and make a tackle, make a good play, and get penalized than it is to back off and get cut because you're not sure. And But, yes, the law of physics is going to come into it quite a bit, and that's unfortunate, but but it's inevitable. John, uh, the replay, I don't know what to say, expansion or having them able to uh, contribute to intentional grounding, roughing the passer, and uh, late hit out of bounds, uh, how do you feel about those and inching closer to a sky judge? I've always thought they need a sky judge. They see the same thing that we see. I'm always have been for Bill Belichick's suggestion every year. Let coaches throw a flag for any penalty. You don't get more challenges. The game's not going to be longer, but let them throw the flag. And, and, and it, if you can't do it in the whole game, I'll do that in the last two minutes, last four minutes, playoffs but we still see so many mistakes being made. So any moves they make to help officiating, I'm all for it. John, uh, your Baylor Bears, uh, there were times when they looked brilliant, and there are too many times when you kind of saw some Achilles or some uh, weaknesses or whatever, and it kind of hit them all at once against Clemson despite the comeback. Your thoughts about where they are, they're no longer a part of the tournament. I know that bothers your week. Yes, it does, especially uh, because I bet on them. I was in Vegas uh, for this you know, Gary Horn, another Waco mayor and Baylor graduate. He and his wife, Kelly, and my wife, Carol, and I, we've gone out for the last two years for the first two rounds. State of Caesars, it's so exciting. Watching the basketball there, it just blows me away. And, of course, I had to bet on the Bears, and I felt terrible for him. I felt terrible for, for Walter. He'll be a top-ten pick, maybe even higher. I think he's missed. He needs to stay and eat some more and get stronger. Spend another year at Baylor would help him. They ain't tell him about Kendall Brown. There's a lot of those Baylor guys who've left early, and now where are they? You know, they can't already all be Jeremy Sochan and, and uh, Mitchell. But I just I felt bad. I was happy for the women. I watched Juju Watkins last night, every play of the game of USC, because she's the next Caitlin Clark. 18 years old, fabulous player. It's going to be fun to watch them. And, boy, what an upset it would be if they could beat USC. You know the networks want the L.A. market because she gets a lot of attention out there. And I hope the Bears, Nick Collin, that they pull the upset. John, I know we're in the midst of just draft season, so there's a lot of speculation, a lot of unnamed sources, a lot of just wishy-washy reports. But uh, how much are you buying in, like, this – J.J. McCarthy love that seems to be going around a lot lately to the point of, you know, being the number two guy to possibly go to the commanders behind Caleb Williams. Craig, scouts could look at every play of his career from every angle. They could look at all of his practice throws if they wanted to. And yet, since he looked good in his shorts and T-shirts, it's the classic case (laughs) of people falling in love with a guy in his underwear. And uh, the late, great C.O. Bucato, the greatest scout I've ever known, I played at Baylor, graduate of Baylor, uh, he always said, if you can't watch tape and make your evaluations, you shouldn't be in a business. Most people write their scouting reports in pencil so they can erase so much based on what they hear. I think it's preposterous that his stock is soaring based on what he's done in shorts and a T-shirt. Now, if the commander's Dumb enough to take him, 
based on what, how he's looked in shorts and a t-shirt and based on Jim Harbaugh talking about his greatest quarterback prospect in the draft, he may go to the Hall of Fame, but if he bombs out, as so many do, who are picked high, they deserve everything they get. It's almost like Drake May and Jaden Daniels don't matter anymore. Possibility, I guess, of seeing the top four, four could be quarterbacks. Arizona could trade down instead of taking Marvin Harrison. But it looks like somebody like Minnesota or Denver are going to get in a war to trade up with Arizona to try to get J.J. McCarthy fourth overall. Unless, of course, he goes second. You know, I can't even believe right now some people aren't saying he's going first over Caleb Williams other than the Bears are not trying to hide too much what their intentions are. All right. What are your thoughts about Dion's preemptive comments about Shadur and Shiloh in the NFL draft or Travis Hunter? It is amazing to me, like uh, Shadur Sanders taking shots at Texas high school players. It's amazing the things that those guys do. They're not the cup of tea for a lot of teams. When you're running over, it's showing your Rolex at the end of a game to, to fans of other teams. It's the kind of things Dion did that Dion had pelts on the wall. Dion can crow and complain and do everything he wants as loud as he wants to do it, and more power to him if he can pull it off. But uh, I think that uh, he didn't name, or he didn't, he said city. He didn't say teams, is what I read. And uh, if that's the way he wants to go about it, good for him. Maybe he'll be, be able to get his sons and, and Hunter right where he wants them to go. And he was talking, praising Atlanta. If you ask most prospects coming out of college where they would like to go, I don't think there'd be a very long list of them wanting to go to the Falcons. John, thank you very much, as always. Hey, good luck to those Baylor Bears. Sick them, guys. That's John McClain, Hall of Fame columnist, usually Tuesdays around 5.30. All right, uh, again, tomorrow we have BYU football coach Kalani Sataki who will join us. Thursday, we're going to be live at Big 12 Pro Days in Frisco at the Ford Center at the Star Cowboys facility. And we'll be there throughout the day, the morning, also broadcast that afternoon. This is 365 Sports. Don's Humidor and Coffee Beans, 48-foot walk-in humidor. Carol, Ashley, Cheyenne, understand the cigar business, know the trends, know what uh, is a, uh, what you would call like a, a, you know, back in the day of Billboard magazine, they would have uh, songs with a bullet headed to the top. Uh, they know, she knows, they know, Cheyenne, Ashley, and Carol, what are the hot brands or the best of the elite brands of cigars that are hot right now, the, the best sellers and those on the rise. Also, a CBD product called Vita Dreams. You could take a gummy or how many you want before you go to bed and maybe have a more relaxful night uh, and not toss and turn for 30 minutes or an hour or two. And then also, for very bad days, that's the name of the THC product for those with chronic pain. Don Chimador and Coffee Beans between Richland Drive and Valley Mills in Waco. Car's price right, day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks built for you, red, white, and blue. Average your car in Texas. Cars that zoom with lots of room. Average your car in Texas. Count on us. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. Stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. See all the things they can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. After my first car accident, I feared the biggest damage would be to my wallet. I expected a mountain of bills and a long, drawn-out process. 
But my Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent was there when I needed her and helped me get back on my feet and in my car in no time. Instead of a hassle, I got reassurance and a quick recovery. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Established in 2007 and independently owned, Alliance Bank Central Texas is committed to helping families and businesses meet their financial goals. From their tellers to their board of directors, they know the importance of superior service and competitive products. Customers have confidence knowing that their financial needs are in good hands. It's your bank, Alliance Bank Central Texas, with two Waco locations, 4721 Bosque Boulevard and 191 Archway Drive on Highway 84 and at AllianceBankTexas.com. Member FDI I see an equal housing lender. It's time for Paul Catalina's Top 5. Brought to you by Texas Beef House. Where's the best beef in Texas? Your house when you order from Texas Beef House. Unleash the flavor of Texas raised Wagyu. From our pasture to your plate, TexasBeefHouse.com. Top five questions facing eliminated Big 12 teams. I left Texas out of this because uh, the question they would have is, um, you know, what's the SEC like? That's the question. They're not a Big 12 team. Now that they're not playing anymore, uh, the basketball, like every time a season ends for Texas, that team is no longer in the Big 12. So football's not in the Big 12. Men's basketball is not in the Big 12. As soon as baseball's over, they won't be in the Big 12 anymore. Uh, and so on and so on and so on. But top five facing the eliminated Big 12 teams. Number five, BYU. Can you add an element to your game? Because they won games this year pretty much one way. Bombing the hell out of threes. If they can find a second element to that, and I think they'll keep their roster mostly in check. I mean, like, I mean, as much as you can in today's world. But... Can you add an element to your game to take it to the next level? Because things are about to get harder because two tournament teams, Arizona and Colorado, are coming in. So you're going to have to find new wrinkles in things. And BYU is impressive. You're one of the Big 12. Can you add something to take you to the next spot? Yeah, they were pretty feast or famine. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, when they were on, they were one of the more fun and unique teams to watch in the country. And when they were not on, they were uh, – way off <laughs> i mean uh it was it was famine uh so yeah they were very much a feast or famine team and and you can't can't really live by that unless you got steph curry litter in your roster or guys like that um but yeah they were very one-dimensional in that regard and, and that does need to become a little less one-dimensional absolutely number four TCU, can you hold on to Jamie Dixon? I think they will through this cycle. It looks like maybe they've come through the storm. Um, but there's a lot, always a lot of talk around him and somebody coming and getting him. Now, he's there's no reason for him to leave TCU, but if someone came along, I thought maybe you know Louisville might get in the mix on Jamie Dixon. I don't think he's a big enough name. And look, the names they're getting right now are probably not um, – you know, as big as, as Jamie Dixon in certain regard. But if you can hold on to Jamie Dixon for another couple of years, I, I think TCU can really start to make some inroads. They they seem to kind of it feels like a plateau. I don't think it is. I think that uh, eventually they're they're gonna they're gonna pop through and do something kind of similar to what Tech did a couple of years ago, where all of a sudden they're really really good. Yeah, I mean they've uh, built up quite the program uh, under him, and I think he's a really great coach. Uh, obviously, a very short stay in the uh, NCAA tournament, but um, yeah, he's a great coach, and I'd imagine there's going to be uh, some folks who have been giving him a phone call or are going to be giving him phone calls. And so, yeah, I mean, the longer they can hold on to him, the the more you can build that program up and and hopefully take it to places it hadn't been in a long time or ever. Yeah, yeah. he does a good job. He recruits well. Yeah. Now, who's the guy that was a really good player that he got a disagreement with? Um, damn, he's on, he, he's. I, I don't know if he's still in the tournament or not. Eddie Lampkin? Eddie yeah, Lampkin. yeah. Now, you, you know, you, you, TCU can't afford to lose Eddie Lampkin. Now, whatever the reasons were – you got to make sure those relationships stay good. That happens. It's going to happen even. He's with, not because he's a Colorado. Yeah. So, so but yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't. When you have him, you cannot lose him unless it's to the point where you can't put up with him. But you got to figure out a way to make that happen. Yeah. Number three, 
Texas Tech, what do they need to take the next step? It, like, you watch games this year, and sometimes they looked, when they were fully healthy, like a complete team. They played good defense, they played good offense, and then other times they looked like a team that was, you know, a Big 12 team that, like most of the Big 12 this year, where you either, you can look great one night, and the next night you can look like, man, I am worn out because that took all of our energy. So I'm not sure, like... I got a feeling, I'm, I'm not... The team you saw who they were this year will look a lot, not saying the players, but they'll look different with their personality and their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Identity. Yeah. That's like, he but will, I don't think he wants to play a lot better defense. Everybody does. Baylor does too. But I think you're going to see a little bit, not that they didn't have grit, but something different about them next year. Yeah, I, I do. And like, and maybe that's just it. Maybe it's not even a personnel thing because you look up and down the roster and I don't see many like problems. I mean, obviously you can go out and get a stud score in the transfer portal or something like that. But, you know, for the most part, I, I you know, I trust Grant McCaslin in the roster building. It's just what it, what was missing that, you know, why do you lose to an NC State? You know, yes, DJ Burns is pushing everybody around, obviously. But, like, why why does that happen? Those are the things he's got to figure out, which I think he will. But I think that's the question, but, and it's 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 unknown. I think there's just there's an X factor that they're just not quite hitting on there. Their big man was hurt a lot. He missed a ton of games. Big big uh, influence inside, and that, that also contributed – to some of the fade that they had. Yeah. Number two, Baylor. How quickly can their five stars contribute? The VJ Edgecombs of the world. How quickly can they? Robert because Wright. Robert Wright. They're going to have to get some contribution from them because you've got four starters likely leaving. I mean, uh, Jalen Bridges and Ray J. Dennis for sure. Jalen Bridges can't really improve his stock anymore, and Ray J. Dennis is out of eligibility. And if the other two freshmen come back, that's a great problem to have. (laughs) I mean, to have all these guys, it's a great problem to have, but that's not likely to happen. So in the world we live in where we don't, you know, live in clouds of marshmallows and candy canes, they're going to have a team that does not have a lot of veterans and not sure which of those veterans will be back and will be built largely out of the transfer portal to find their starters. And so they're going to need VJ Edgecombe and Wright to contribute right away. I mean, they're really going to have to have something. Happen. Wright's a guy that can handle the ball. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm, I saw, I've seen video of Edgecombe, but uh, Wright can handle the ball. Uh, they'll get another guard or two in the oh. portal, like they are, the, like all the time. Point the guard in the portal some, is just a like a Scott oh. Drew automatic. But one of the things that it was said about what Butler and Teague and Davion Mitchell was, those guys were not only transfers, but they had a year to marinate and grow up, and that just doesn't happen anymore because the transfer portal rules are different. So you don't have a time to kind of have them and then build and gain more experience and yet. Chemistry, chemistry. I don't know if it could even happen enough anymore. You also don't have guys who stay for three, four years going in the lottery of the NBA draft anymore. Right, absolutely. Like that's not that's not. I, I've seen the arguments of like the one and dones failed and they've got to go back. Like there's a combination. It's right. go get veterans in the portal and have your star freshman, and that's the combination. Yeah. But they didn't have much in the way of veterans because the Langston Love gets hurt. And yeah. do they win that game with Langston Love? Very much. A chance that yeah. they do. Oh, they may win I mean, three or four of the games. Exactly. But, so, like, yeah. how off was the roster really? The mm. roster seems like it was probably fine, yeah. but a big piece got hurt, and all of a sudden that veteran leadership's not well, there. And I don't think you, that you can rely on freshmen to lead. I think that's the thing. Like, you want that talent, but you don't necessarily expect them to be like the ones leading yeah. the way, so to speak. And people forget about the 21 team. I don't know if there's been a team in sports history that has gone through the season injury free like that one did the only injury they had was collectively they got COVID. that was it yeah i mean they had and almost derailed the season man. but like nobody missed significant time for knees ankles yep. anything everyone was like when they were playing gonzaga that night no one even was sore yep. like they were just ready to go and definitely that not afterwards so rare. Yeah. the thing i'm worried about with langston and i think he brings a physicality too because he's a thick physical player is that he has a history even if it's fluky stuff like his eye remember got poked or whatever and he can't stay healthy and some of it's just bad luck hopefully he can stay and remain healthy because they surely they need him if they could keep walter or Misi next year either one would be winning the lottery literally they probably won't keep either one but which of those two would you rather have I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd probably rather have Walter just get based on how 
guard play yeah. is. I thought Misi was about to pop near the last quarter of the season. Remember against Kansas? Yeah. And then it, it, it now, just kind of – I mean, Ashley said in his, his post today that, you know, there's – I guess the biggest chance would be for Misi to come back because maybe because he didn't play well in the tournament, mm. you know, he, he might come back. But – that would still a small But I think Macy, would he not be drafted ahead of Walter? No, I think Walter's going okay. to okay. uh, Walter's gonna get right. picked ahead of okay. him. Well, uh, but I mean, probably not, not not far enough to where it's going to matter. Well, there's not that many lottery picks. I mean, picks. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and he might be a lottery pick, but he might be top 20, and even then, you got to go. All right. Um, number one, Kansas. What does the roster look like next season? Dwan Harris is back. Hunter Dickinson likely back. KJ Adams likely back. Uh, Furphy is in question, but I think he'll be back. So you've got four of those starters back now. Okay. It all rides on Timberlake. <laughs> I think he's out of eligibility, by yeah. the way. Uh, I, we didn't talk about it, but I thought it was funny. Uh, after the game against Samford the other night, Nick Timberlake said, man, I, I couldn't believe how many fans Samford had. And then after he left, Bill sells like, I'm gonna have to tell him later. Those were Gonzaga fans. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like they, they, you know, they were hoping, you know, now granted it didn't matter who right. Gonzaga played. Right. They could have played the, you know, the 90, 96 bulls. If you're going to make 80% of your shots, you're yep. not going to lose. Yep. Um, but uh, Kansas has, you know, four, maybe five guys for sure on the roster next year, but this roster is going to look very different. And I wouldn't be surprised. Like, wouldn't totally shock me if there was one of those guys I mentioned that out of nowhere wasn't there. I think Furphy's back, even though he's got some NBA buzz, he's got to get bigger and stronger and more durable uh, for a year. But they are, you want to talk about a team that is putting out the open for business sign. Yeah. It is Bill Self in Kansas and he's healthy this year. <laughs> he's healthy because I I think it was a huge factor last year that at, right after the tournament which is when you have to do kind of your wheeling and dealing on things. Well, he couldn't do all the things he normally did and to get Hunter Dickinson that was that was incredible, uh, but you know, the Arterium more like more disappointing with, year, Kansas or Baylor. Um I say Kansas. I think, I think Kansas, Kansas because there. Dickinson, because of Dickinson. Well, and look, he he and was they great. Had their point guard, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. They had their like they had, but they didn't have the depth. And right. but I do like it's one of those things. Like you know, we talked about with Alabama and football this year, um, and maybe it's gonna be different with Kalen DeBoer. But you know, when they were struggling early on offense, this is before we all knew that Nick Saban was gonna retire. You're like, well. Enjoy this year where Alabama seems a little gettable, right? SEC because they're not going to let it happen again, right? And, but you know, enjoy this year, Big Twelve, that Kansas was gettable because uh, somebody's lit a fire. Hey, but Arizona coming in, yeah. Colorado well, I mean, that's the fire. Some, some yeah. uh, heat coming that's in. That's the fire. Yeah. yeah. All right, Paul. Thank you very much, Garrett Ross. Thank you very much. Emery Winter is working on three sixty five. Sports tonight for uh, 1030 tonight in the local CW. We mentioned this. Please hit hi uh, like and subscribe if you can. Spread the word. We'd love to see that. The subscriber growth continues. We'd love to pass the next thresh threshold, which is, I think, 40,000. We're not, are we, are we over 38, nine? Yeah, we're 38, seven right now uh, on our way to 38, eight, by, probably by the end of the week. Look, I say screw 40. Let's go to 50. Craig's on his way <laughs> to Baylor football and post practice media. I'm David Smoke. That's Craig Smoke, and he's Paul Catalina. This, thank you very much, is 365 Sports. Ideal MRI is a